The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. We're webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters in Tarzana, California. It's Friday. We're going to be with you live for the next three hours talking about topics on the autism spectrum, how we can be more efficient, more effective working with children on the autism spectrum. We're going to talk about ABA and we're going to talk about a bunch of different things, but we do talk about ABA a lot and I always like to remind you guys why. ABA, which stands for Applied Behavior Analysis, is the only scientifically proven effective treatment for autism. And guess what? Not only has it been proven to be scientifically effective, it is scientifically proven to be effective with all of our kids on the spectrum. And what do I mean by effective? We're going to see progress. It's not going to be a waste of your time, and I know how valuable your time is. So whether you have a child who's very young or a child who is significantly older, and even an adult, ABA is going to be effective at creating progress. Whether your child is someone who is very profoundly affected by autism, no matter what age they are, or they're someone who just has a few skill deficits, ABA is something that can be very effective at targeting specific behaviors that you want to increase and targeting specific behaviors that you want to decrease. And I always like to remind all of us, myself included, that not only is it effective for our kids on the autism spectrum, it's effective for all of us. Uh, so I know some of you say, well, you know, I, this is a whole other thing to learn and I don't really have a whole lot of time. I have other kids who are not on the spectrum. I, I you know, I need to help my child who's on the spectrum, but I can't neglect these other children. The great thing about ABA is when you learn these tools, you just become a better parent, become a better teacher, become a better person and better at interacting with other people and also reaching your own goals. It's really effective for all of those things. So that's why we talk about ABA a lot, but we talk about other stuff as well because we know that this journey, I know that this journey involves a lot of different things. And we can talk about how great ABA is, but if you can't can't get access to it, then what good is it to you, right? And if you can't afford it, if you can't figure out how to mount the funding issue, what good is it to talk about how effective it is? And you got to deal with the stress and you got to deal with day to day things, uh, life and getting food on the table and getting the laundry done. I get it because I am not an expert in ABA, not an expert in autism, but I'm a mom. My son was diagnosed when he was two and a half years old and he started ABA when he just after his third birthday. He is now nine years old and I'm still sur <laughs> surviving. We've all survived to this point. It was not easy. It continues to not be easy. I've given up on, I don't know what the words normal, typical, and easy are. What I, what does that mean anyway? It's all relative. Uh, but we have made a tremendous amount of progress as a family. My son has made a tremendous amount of progress. And I'm excited to be able to help you get access to the answers that you need. That's really what I am as the conduit to help you to find the answer that you need for an individual question. And so please don't think that it's just me sitting here and I'm going to, you know, figure it all out. Uh, I, I don't know what I don't know. Right. <laughs> and, but I have been given access on your behalf to people who do have answers in different segmented areas. So we have experts come in here. We have other parents come in here. We hope to lift you up and hold on to you and answer the questions that you need answered, get you access to the information that is out there. Boy, this week has been absolutely, I, you know, there are times when I think, well, 
you know, autism awareness and and we're we're doing a lot and more people are understanding and it's a word that's getting used a lot. And then something happens and you realize how far we have left to go. I don't know, it literally makes me sick to my stomach. Some of the conversations that we've had to have this week, uh, because when you realize how much in misinformation is out there. Of course, I'm talking a little bit about the Joe Scarborough thing. You know, I honestly, I said it earlier this week, I'm gobsmacked. I just, I, you know me, I'm never speechless. I'm a little speechless on this and disheartened, disheartened that a parent, a parent who is supposed to be, uh, you know, sitting in a forum in which you would think they would be curious and uh, get informed, um, doesn't know. But you know what? I, no more casting aspersions. I want for that parent to be informed because he has a mouthpiece to inform other parents. So Joe Scarborough, if you're listening, I want to talk. I want to talk because I can't, I'm having trouble sleeping this week knowing that you're walking around thinking that when somebody has a social deficit that it's the same thing as uh, something that is psychotic. It isn't. It isn't, Joe, and it makes me so sad to the very tips of my toes that you don't know that. And if Joe Scarborough doesn't know that, I can't even imagine how many other parents out there don't know that. And I can rail against that, but I, I don't want to rail it. I want to get into the solution, not the problem. So we're going to be talking about that and other things about understand exactly what autism is and what it isn't because there's a lot of misinformation out there so we're going to stomp it out like little wildfires as we go along um, but in any case if you have questions if that's something that you have been thinking or that you heard Joe Scarborough's comment and you thought that it it made a certain amount of sense I'm so glad you're here because it is not an informed comment at all. Uh, I, later on today, we are going to go over the DSM-4, the current diagnostic tool for autism, to talk about what is, uh, you know, what are symptoms of autism because everything that's not there, you know. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, <laughs> it's Friday, uh, but you know, we got to keep plugging. There are times when I'm sure like you, I go, are you kidding me? Are you kidding? But you know, we just, we got to deal with what we have to deal with. And if there, if there's that level of ignorance out there, then uh, it's all right. Uh, we'll, we'll take it one ignorant comment at a time if that's what we have to do. Okay, I mentioned that I want you guys to participate in this conversation, whether it's just to, to call me up and, and tell me that you're outraged too, or to say that you're having a day where you just don't think you can educate one more person, or whether it's to say, hey, I've got an idea of how we can educate Joe Scarborough, or if you say, here's what's going on with my child, do you have an expert who can give me some support and some advice? By the way, there were a couple of questions that you guys asked when we had Holly Robinson Pete on the show on Wednesday um, that were much more of a therapy end of things, and I've saved a couple of those questions, and we're going to be answering those a little bit th uh, more throughout the day today. Uh, so if you're watching and your question didn't get answered, by the I also want to mention we had Holly on and you can watch if you missed it and I know some of you did you can watch it now on a couple of different places we'll talk about that in a second but we also kept her after she was so sweet you guys and so giving of her time so generous and we kept her afterwards because we had all these questions and tweets to answer and uh, so she stayed after for a good 20 minutes we filmed a whole other portion of the interview that we did not air live you can only watch it on YouTube and I believe it's up there now okay so uh, let's talk about how you can be a part of the conversation. If you're watching us right now on autism-live.com, then you'll see that it either says live or rebroadcast. If it says live, then in fact, we are live right now. And you see that box that says your questions, it's active. You don't have to log in. You don't have to give a credit card number or your email address, nothing at all. You just have to type in, hit enter. And it appears magically right here on my screen. I love technology. Uh, when it works. 
<laughs> not so much when it doesn't but today it's working you know fingers crossed knocking on all kinds of wood uh, so please uh, take the opportunity to say here's what I wanted to have more information about here's what's working for me about the show here's uh, a suggestion for somebody I'd like to see on your show all of those things or you can just write and tell me where you're watching from I really we're in 103 different countries now and I love to hear I mentioned on the show the other day I'm geographically challenged uh, but it's helping me when you guys write in and say where you're watching from because then I, I run out in the hallway to look at the map and see and go oh my gosh that's where that country is I'm, I'm learning and heaven knows I need to my son is at that grade where it's all about geography and so I'm trying to brush up here help me out tell me where you're where you're watching from so that I'll look at the map in any case you can if it says rebroadcast there are other ways that you can get in touch with us and you can watch us on other forums as well and we'll go over those in a second but one of the different ways that you can get a hold of us 24 hours a day seven days a week wherever you are is via email so feel free to write in your email questions. We get your, we're, we got a little bit of a backlog right now on your email questions, but we're covering them on the next available live show. I know many of you have written in and said that you'd like to be a guest and I'm getting ready to do the August and September schedule. So I will be in touch with you. If you have a topic that you would like to discuss here on Autism Live, we're very, very interested in you can email us. Uh, and you can send questions, suggestions, whatever you'd like, comments, uh, on email as well. We will cover it on the next available show and we will send you an email response as well. You can also phone in to the studio here. You can speak to somebody. We have people standing by waiting to talk to you or you can be patched in and you can talk to me and whatever expert I happen to be talking to at the moment, which is a really fun thing. If you call when we're not live, and by the way, we're live 9 a.m. to noon Pacific Standard Time. So whatever time that translates for you, that's when we're live. If you call when we're not live you can leave us a message and we will get back to you the next time we are back in the studio you can also Skype in with us if during the live show if you'd like to Skype in if you have a camera built into your computer and you don't mind having us put your picture up uh, next to mine we're happy to do that or you can Skype in audio only your choice you can uh, do that and we've been able to Skype internationally which is really really fun so uh, just some of the ways you can get in touch with us by the way you can also talk to us via Facebook. I know in just a few minutes we're going to go over the question of the day and I love it's I there's so many different aspects of the day that I love but I really love to see what you guys write in terms of the question of the day and I really love it when you start interacting with each other. There are times when when somebody will write in and say they're having a tough time and boy I love how you guys all immediately offer support to that person. It's a really wonderful thing. And uh, I think that's, I, you know, that's one of the ways in which we make friends and we get lifted up. Let's face it, sometimes our friends and family that are close to us don't have the skills, especially in the beginning, to know how to support us on this journey. Uh, so that's a book somebody needs to write. What to do when your friend's child is diagnosed with autism. Would somebody please write that book? Um, because they don't have a place to go to to figure out what they should be doing to support us. So it takes them a while and some of them never get it. Some of them get it a year or two down the road. Uh, but in the meantime, you need some support, right? And I love it when you guys do that for each other in the community. It's a wonderful thing. You can also tweet with us. I am a novice at the tweeting thing. I, Holly Robinson Pete was here the other day and she is a brilliant tweeter. She's a professional tweeter. I'm, I'm working on it but I love it when you guys tweet and it makes it more reinforcing for me and I'm more likely to be tweeting if I see that you guys are tweeting as well. So help me out help me to be more efficient at the tweeting thing. Uh, I mentioned that there are other ways that you can be watching our show, and there are. There are many ways, and I, I'm very happy and proud to be able to say that on all of these different ways that you can watch us, they're free. Isn't that a wonderful thing? That there is no cost. Nobody's asking you to sign up with a credit card. You can right now, if you would like to, on our Facebook, sign up. There is a thing there that you can sign up and give us your email address if you'd like like to start getting our monthly newsletter that we're going to start to put out because we have so much information and so many people we thought that that would be a really good thing but that's the only time that we're asking for your email is to send you the the monthly newsletter but the rest of the time totally totally free 
So what am I talking about? Blip.tv. This is a wonderful way that you can watch us because, for instance, if you missed the Holly Robinson Pete episode, you can go on Blip and you can find it. It was on Wednesday and everything is dated there. You can see some of the different topics and, you know, if you are in a hurry and you want to watch the part where Holly Robinson Pete talked about Joe Scarborough, then you can fast forward through everything and then you go, oh, you know, they were talking about this. I want to rewind and hear what she said about 50 Cent. I want to pause it because I got to go to OT. You can do all of that on Blip TV. You can also do that on YouTube. We have our own channel there. And what I love about YouTube is that we've got some of the shorter interviews there. If you just want to see the segment with Holly Robinson Pete, you can go and watch that. You can also see the unaired <laughs> part of the interview, the opera show. Uh, we were having a good time talking about that the other day, and it was so fun to have her here. I encourage you to check that out. Uh, and we are also available in a couple of other places as well. You can download us for free on iTunes. How lovely is that? I know there's a lot of things that you can buy on iTunes, but we're free on iTunes. And I know I keep promising the audio only, audio only portion is coming. It is. I just don't know when at this point. <laughs> but you can download the whole show, picture and sound, right now for free on iTunes. And we're also available on Ustream. I want to thank Ustream for uh, providing that service for us. And again, free. Uh, you got to love that. So all of those different ways that you can watch and all of those ways that you can participate. Hey, if there's a way that you know of that you could be watching us that we don't have listed here, would you do me a favor? And would you use one of those different ways, tweet, Facebook, email, call, Skype, and let us know? Because if we're not on that site, it's because we don't know about it, pretty much. Uh, so love it if you would let us know how it would be easier for you to watch. One of the things that we talked about endlessly as we were starting this show and that we still talk about now, uh, because it's always sort of my litmus test is, you know, how is the mom in Kansas or how is the mom in Zimbabwe or how is the dad in China that wants this information? How is it going to work for them? And we know you all have different constraints, right? Different times that you can watch, different ways that you can watch. We're always trying to think of that, but I will remind you that I am not a mind reader, but I'm interested and curious as to how, what you need and how the best way to deliver it is. If you've got ideas, please, I'm begging you, tell me, uh, cause really that's why we're here is to support you. And if we're not doing it, I want to know how we can do a better job. I wish that I, on the first day that my son was diagnosed with autism, I had some place to go where I could say, what do you, you know, tell me about this. And I didn't, I didn't, I found ways of making it work and cobbling it together. But my whole mantra in coming here is that if I can save you five minutes and $5, that's going to give you more time and more money to spend on your child so that you can get further. And that's really what I want for you is to feel empowered and to feel like you make a difference in your child's life. I know having been on this journey that there is information that can help you to help your child. So I, that's, that's what I'm all about. That's my paying it forward because people helped me. If I, I shudder to think where, I don't know where we would be. I don't know where we would be. And I don't like to go there. Uh, honestly, because I get to sit with my son and have conversations with him and have him tell me things that he wants to do with his life and know that he can and talk about his friends and his buddies. Um, <clears throat> and I didn't know. I didn't know if I was going to have that. And I know that in your darkest hours, you don't know where you're going to end up, right? But I'm here to tell you that there's progress that this, how it is today, is not how it has to stay, that you can change things. And it's gonna be different for all of our kids. They're all gonna end up in different places, but I know for a fact, and it's been scientifically shown, that there is progress available for all of our kids. I don't care whether they have multiple diagnoses, but there's progress to be had. Or if you've got a child who's on that really high functioning end of things that just needs a little bit of support, uh, 
there are, there's so much that can be done so much that can be done so stick with us hey one of the things that we like to do we start every morning with something that i fondly refer to as the jargon of the day this is the time of day when we uh you know part of it is we make fun of the jargon i'll be honest with you because let's face it there's a lot to be made fun of <laughs> we had dr adele nadowski in here yesterday and i feel like I, you know, because I work with BCBAs on a regular basis and I ask them questions and I'm picking their brains constantly and we talk about the jargon every day. And my son had five years of intensive ABA and we're doing skills now at home. It's not like the jargon isn't a part of my life, right? And, uh, and we had Dr. Nadowski here yesterday, and she went on a run of a whole bunch of stuff that she was saying. And I would tell you honestly that maybe 75% of it I completely got, and the other 25% I was like, you know? And at one point she kind of looked at me and she said, I feel like I just have used a lot of jargon. And I said, Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think so. But. <clears throat> How amazing, though, to see a perfect example of why we need to make friends with the jargon. Because she was talking about stuff that makes a difference in our kids' lives today. Today, a way that we can change things so that our children can be in the highest, least restrictive environment at school and stay there and our teachers can be empowered so that they know what to do and how to do it so that our children can be there and learn. How much more important can something be, right? Uh, you know, I, I guess maybe CPR could be slightly more important than that, maybe a lot more important depending on what's going on. But, you know, I know when we go to take CPR classes, we ask questions and get familiar with the terms that they're using because it's life and death. And in some respects, I think for our kids, this is the difference of whether our kids get to have the life that they deserve. So in that respect, it is life and death to make friends with these terms and understand and be efficient and effective. So we take it a little bit at a time instead of like Dr. Nadowski with the big paragraph, we take it a little at a time, these words and phrases and anagrams to say, okay, what is this? How does this relate to my child? So there we are. Today's word is one that's gonna seem like it's not that unfamiliar to you. Uh, you probably have heard this word throughout your life in different contexts. Uh, it is deprivation. And I think we've all heard of this, being oxygen deprived, being deprived of something else, you know, depriving someone of something, a state of deprivation. So what does this have to do with autism? All right, we're gonna give you our actual definition first. Yep, it's a long one. Read along with me. An establishing operation, I know, right there, you lost me, right? An establishing operation that results in increasing the reinforcing value of a particular event or stimulus and thus increases the frequency of behaviors, right? <laughs> relevant to those events as consequences, i.e. person is more likely to engage in behavior that has previously resulted in access to those events or stimuli in the past. Yes, this is why we have to do the jargon of the day because when you go and you look these words up and you go, what on earth does this mean? All right, then we have a working definition. Let's see if there's, we can gain any more access. It's still long. Okay, deprivation. When a child's access to something is withheld or restricted for a period of time, resulting in that thing seeming even more desirable to them, increasing the chance that the child will engage in behaviors that have previously resulted in access to those things. All right. So we talk all the time about creating states in which our children are more likely to succeed, right? Um, so deprivation is something that we're going to use. It's a tool that we're going to use and we are not going to tease our children with it and we're not doing it to punish. I want to make that abundantly clear, but let's say that your child loves to watch cartoons, loves it. It's what they live and breathe for. It's what they want to do all the time. If you turn off the television, it's the kind of thing that they're likely to melt down over because they want to watch the cartoons. And you think to yourself, 
uh, you know, I, I don't know how I'm going to survive this because my child is so into cartoons. Well, we've talked about before that in order for any behavior to be maintained, it's got to be reinforcing, right? So there are going to be some difficult things that we're going to ask a child with autism to do that are already hard for them, right? If they could have just learned language on their own, that guess what? They would have, right? So we know it's already hard for them. How are we going to get to them to do something that's hard for them? We're going to give them some sort of a reinforcement for it. We're going to, you know, make something about it worthwhile, right? So the first thing that we look at is what do they absolutely love? And usually it's going to be something that, you know, I, I think most often parents can say, oh, well, the thing that my child perseverates on, I know that's probably not the word you use, this is what happens when you make friends with the jargon and you start using these terms, uh, that whatever your child is really into, really obsessed with, that's, and when, when they perseverate on it, it means that it's like they want it all the time. That's a good place to start. What we do, you know, I remember my son was really into Buzz Lightyear. Everything was Buzz Lightyear, and he had a Buzz Lightyear toy that was the sun, the moon, and the stars, and he had a couple of other little Buzz Lightyear toy things, but there was one toy in particular that talked and made noises and loved the Buzz Lightyear toy. So also loved being a pirate and sword fights. Very, very, very reinforcing to my son as a little boy. Great. So what we would do is not take the Buzz Lightyear toy and stick it in his face and go, we're going to take this and put it away and you're not going to have access to it. Oh, no, 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 right? Uh, what we would do is while he was asleep taking a nap or uh, for the night, if when he, when he finally went, it was hard in the beginning to get him to go down for the night, but when he did, he was down, uh, we would take the Buzz Lightyear toy and we would take and put it away someplace where it wasn't visible. Um, in the beginning, when we were trying to get him to manned, uh, you know, there, I've said before, there was no opportunity that, uh, there, everything was an opportunity, excuse me. He never got anything for free. It's like putting them to work, right? You want the Buzz Lightyear toy, you're going to have to vocalize and say, buh. And then you're going to say, buh. And then you're going to say, buzz, right? And then eventually you're going to say, buzz. Um, but if the Buzz Lightyear toy was around all the time and he could have access to it anytime, you know, it, he's not going to work that hard for it. But he would wake up in the morning and he would get up and, and, and he'd be looking around everywhere. And I, and I would get him to make eye contact with me and, and I would get him to ask for buzz and because buzz wasn't available all the time it's sort of like supercharging buzz buzz was something that he was interested in before but now because he doesn't know where it is and he hasn't had access to it he wants the buzz light year it may be that your child loves chocolate chip cookies right? But if you give your child a chocolate chip cookie for breakfast and then say, hey, you know, if you do something, I'm going to give you another chocolate chip cookie. It may be that the chocolate chip cookie is exciting enough that your child is going to be thrilled to do the thing, but am I not, right? And we're always trying to set our kids up for success. So the things that are really reinforcing to them, we're just going to create uh, a state in which they don't have access to it all the time. I started with the cartoons. If the child loves cartoons, there was a period of time when my son was not into cartoons, but right about when we potty started potty training, all of a sudden he got into cartoons. And I will tell you, you know what's interesting? He didn't like color cartoons. I, there, I think there was too much sensory for him. He liked old black and white cartoons. And there was one, you know those kinds of things you can get at the dollar store? The old, old, old cartoons. Uh, and some of them are not very politically correct, let me just say. But there was one about a chicken. I don't even remember what happened, but he thought it was hilarious. And we, back in the day, before you could pull things up on a phone, and uh, this is how long ago. <laughs> It was like five years ago. Uh, we you had those portable DVD players, and so we didn't let him watch cartoons any other time than when he was in the bathroom. And he got to have the DVD that had the chicken cartoon. He would go in to sit on the toilet and we would set the timer for five minutes and he got to sit and watch that cartoon for five minutes. He couldn't wait to go in the bathroom. But if we had allowed him to have access to that cartoon, you know, like at two o'clock in the afternoon, just because, or at, right after dinner because he did something else, it, it, it would have lost some of its 
power, you know what I mean? Uh, some of its glitter, some of its shine. We want it. We want to set up a state in which the person really wants it. If you think about, it, if you love chocolate cake and you haven't had chocolate cake in 30 days and you sit and have a piece of cho chocolate cake, oh, it's wonderful, right? It's, but if you had it every day, Eh, you know, it's still good, but it's not as wonderful. Creating a state of deprivation, making it more likely that it's going to work as a really powerful reinforcer to overcome things that are hard for them. But again, we're not doing this at a punishment. Uh, we, and so we're being very clever and sly about how we create the deprivation. And we are not doing it, teasing the child saying, I'm putting it away, right? Because that would be a form of punishment. And we also want to be careful about what we deprive things of. We're never going to deprive a child of food and water, uh, right? We're going to be mindful if we're teaching toileting at night to not give them a whole bunch of water right before they go to bed. Uh, but we don't want to be depriving them of life sustaining things ever, right? I would think that would go without saying, but doesn't hurt to say. Okay. Um, and we're just doing it for a small period of time to make it more supercharged. It's not like we put Buzz Lightyear away for 30 days. We're putting it away overnight so that in the morning when we get to something that we want to work on, uh, the child is like thrilled to be reunited with Buzz Lightyear. Okay. Um, we always have for you a question of the day. I mentioned this earlier because it's one of the things that we enjoy interacting with you on our Facebook page about. By the way, again, uh, please, we appreciate all of your likes and your shares for our Facebook page. And there is now a box there where you can put in your address, your email address, if you would like to get our monthly newsletter. Okay, our question today, because we've asked a lot of tough questions this week. What are you wishing for? What are you wishing for? And it can be anything. You're wishing for a new refrigerator. You're wishing for an afternoon off. You're wishing for world peace. You're wishing for thin thighs. It reminds me of that joke. Uh, the, the woman walking along the beach and uh, she comes across the genie in the bottle and she rubs the bottle. The genie comes out and says, you only get one wish. And she says, one wish? I thought three wishes. And he says, no, tough economy, one wish. And she says, she thinks about it and she says, okay, I wish for thin thighs. And the genie says, really, lady, like, do you have any idea all the things that are going on with on earth and, and all the things, all the people, all the different things that are going on and really your one wish, you wish for thin thighs. She thinks about it again and she says, you know what, you're right. Okay, thin thighs for everyone. Um, yeah, <laughs> a lame joke, but it made me think of it. Uh, but what are you wishing for? If you could have one wish, what would it be? Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I, I usually, I try to think about these beforehand and this week I've been hopeless. Um, but I don't know. Cause I'm, I'm always so superstitious about wishing for things. I guess I wish that, uh, out of everything else that people would be kind to each other. You know, just across the board, not just people with autism and accepting of people with autism, but how about if everybody just be, it has a moment where we stop and appreciate what other people are going through and be kind. Uh, and as I think about that, then I have some work myself to do <laughs> to be kind. Uh, but wouldn't that be great if everybody just was kind and supportive to everybody else? How much different would our kids' lives be? How much different would our lives be? That would be really wonderful. But I'd love to hear from you guys. I'll bet you've got better ideas than I do. We're going to check in a little bit later in the next hour on Facebook to hear what you guys have to say. I can't wait to hear what your wishing for. All right. We always have a topic of the day. The topic of the day, uh, has turned into the topic of the week. And this week, very aptly, it's problem solving. We know we're going to have problems and, uh, you know, sometimes it takes you back. You step back for a minute and you go, Oh man, how are we ever going to get through this? Right? Uh, my husband has a phrase cause sometimes it seems like things just come on a whole bunch at a time. And my husband, uh, I will say he calls it something akin into a poop storm, but he doesn't say poop. Uh, he says, well, we're just in the middle of a poop storm because it's never just one thing, right? Uh, I think about the wonderful blogger dad, Tom Hibben, who, 
three little boys and trying to make uh, a business take off. He and his wife have a photography business and one son on the spectrum trying to keep his head above water and keep things in perspective and keep a sense of humor. And he does a very good job of it. And then their home burns down. You know, uh, it's one of those things. I mean, stuff happens. And how do we get through it? How do we problem solve? How do we go around things, through things, under things, over things, so that we can figure out how to get where we need to get, even though there are going to be problems? So that's what we're talking about all this week. Um, you know, this, this autism awareness thing, uh, it's a big problem and we need to be working on the solutions. So to that end, some of the different things we're going to talk about today, we have an academic tip for you. I'm thrilled that we have a social tip. And so much of what we've been talking about this week is this idea of what is the difference between a social deficit and what happened in Colorado? Uh, yeah. Um, but let's talk about autism and when children are not reinforced by social interaction and how we can change that because we can. Um, and then at 11 o'clock, we are going to have Dr. Jonathan Tarbox with us. And one of the things that I'm going to be asking him to do is go through the diagnosis and talk about what it actually is and what that social deficit is with autism and what it's not. Uh, so we're going to hear that from an expert. A lot of really exciting things to talk about today. And of course, we are always interested in your questions and we have some questions to catch up on that some of you asked the other day during the Holly Robinson Pete interview that were more therapy specific. And so we're going to be discussing those as well. We are going to take a break. And in this break, we've been starting to show you some of the interviews that we have done uh, the, when we went up to ABAI. Um, and this was an international conference for BCBAs, board certified behavior analysts, people whose job, whose lives it is uh, to provide ABA. I want you to remember that not all of the people who went to ABA, in fact, I would say the vast majority of, maybe not the vast majority, but certainly more than 50% of the people who were there were not necessarily people who were dealing in the field of autism, but there was a whole autism track, some truly amazing experts that were there that we had an opportunity to sit down with. It was very, you know, run and catch people in a hallway uh, and interview them. So they weren't the best possible interview uh, circumstances, but they were troopers. They were so excited knowing that what they were going to say was, was going to be available for parents. They were thrilled. And one of the different people that we talked to that we're about to show, uh, Dr. Wayne Fisher, a really wonderful expert in the field of autism. And he, we asked him specifically, he has a wide range of expertise, but we specifically asked him about elopement and wandering. And so take a look at what Dr. Wayne Fisher had to say about elopement with autism. Well, we have uh, developed a uh, protocol for assessing behaviors in children with autism. And basically, the kids come out into two broad areas and sometimes it's a mixture of the two. Some of the children we see uh, we would call wandering. They're, they haven't learned the skills of knowing that you're supposed to stay close to mom or dad, walk next to them, you know, not walk off on your own and just wander off or um, stop and look at things and not notice that mom or dad has kept going and turned around the corner and are now out of sight. Uh, Typically developing children have what we call stranger anxiety and it seems to be uh, have a biological basis and they so they learn to stick very close to mom and dad especially at a very young age. <clears throat> Kids with autism are much less likely to show that sort of thing and so we see this wandering behavior uh, more often in young children with autism than in typically developing uh, kids. So that's one group is what we call the wanderers. Um, and then there's another group of kids that we that kind of bolt or elope, uh, and these are children who typically do it for a reason. There's a goal. Uh, sometimes that is when we try to get them to do tasks that they don't like doing, uh, they run away from us. Uh, other kids, uh, when we're not providing attention, they run away to see if we will react uh, to their running. 
and other kids will run to gain access to what we call tangible items. Uh, and sometimes that is just running to get to the playground, like typically kids would do, but doing it you know, more intently, uh, oftentimes not watching, not when they cross the street, could run in front of a car. Uh, and then also we sometimes see kids bolting for tangible items that are kind of unusual. Uh, that the children with autism often have unusual interests. And so we may have a child with autism who is bolting to pick up an unusual looking rock or to go to the elevator and press and stim on the buttons. Uh, we had one little guy that would go to the um, soda machine and it, big, you know, fancy colored lights behind it and he'd go and tap on it and look at it and listen to it and, and engage in stealth stimulatory behavior on that particular object, but that was where, when he ran away, he ran away to that. And so we've developed a set of procedures for looking at the kids, <clears throat> starting with a descriptive assessment, where we have them walk along a prescribed route, and sometimes we bait the prescribed route with things that might tempt a child to run away to get to. Uh, sometimes we give them demands to see if, while we're walking with them, if we're telling them to do things, tuck in your shirt, comb your hair. Uh, are they more likely to bolt to get away from those tasks we're asking them to do? And so we've developed this uh, set of walks that help us to determine are these children just wandering and don't know when they should stop with us or walk with us? And then we have a set of uh, treatments that are matched to the function or the purpose of the child's uh, uh, elopement or wandering or bolting. The, treatment that we prescribe then is a very skill acquisition based treatment to teach the child that they need to stay within arm's length of the adult they're walking with and we have specific procedures for doing that training. If the child tends to be a bolter then we do a functional analysis to understand why they're bolting, what they're bolting to get, what is the goal or outcome that is reinforcing the behavior, and then we develop a specific intervention to address that function or that purpose. I would imagine, though, that the assessment that you do, those directed walks, are things that you re are a controlled environment and really need to be done by professionals. Is that true? Yes, and that's where we're at right now, and we start with that. We develop the treatment. We teach the child uh, when it's safe to go and do things, when it's safe to move away from the adult, and then we train the parents to implement the procedures. And um, over time, we want to get so the child's elopement is under appropriate, what we would call stimulus control. They're doing it at the right time when they have signals to tell them it's safe to move away from mom or dad, but when it's not, that they need to stay close by. For example, one of the uh, first children that we worked with bolted whenever she saw a dog. She just loved dogs. Uh, and her training went so that gradually we would expose her to different things that she would run away for and the dog was the kind of final test case where she would have to walk uh, about a quarter of a mile, walk right by a dog, go back to her starting point and then we would say to the signal, now it's safe to go and see the dog. And we arranged so that that would occur in a safe location uh, inside a fence and make sure it's a safe dog to be around. Uh, but to teach them that, yes, sometimes it's okay to run and go see a dog and sometimes it's not and here's when it is appropriate and here's when it's not appropriate and teach those skills and then teach the parents to be able to implement that protocol. We hear a lot from parents who f give up. They feel like they're never going to be able to stop a child from eloping and we always like to give them with hope. What kind of success do you have? Sure. We uh, recently pulled together uh, the data from about... Uh, a dozen cases mm -hmm. and the average reduction in elopement was about 95 uh, percent. In all cases we were able to reduce elopement by about uh, by at least 85 percent. Uh, so uh, in the vast majority of cases we can greatly reduce this, in some cases uh, reduce it to zero, but in the most cases reduce it to a, a great deal and make it much more manageable for parents. Wonderful, wonderful interview with Dr. Wayne Fisher and some really good information. And I hope that if you want more information that you, the, uh, the web address was there on the video. And throughout the day today, we're going to be showing you some more interviews and throughout the coming weeks, uh, there were so many interviews that we did. So we're going to be showing you some more interviews of some really amazing people. I, I can't state enough that 
I, I, you know, when we started on this journey, there was so much of the time that I felt so alone, so alone and said, why aren't more people, why aren't there people to help us? Why, you know, what I did, I felt alone. I, and I felt like people didn't care because I was at the grocery store. And you know what the truth was at the grocery store, there were a lot of people who didn't care, didn't know. And there wasn't that awareness. And I think we get into this headset where we think that that must be how it is everywhere. You know, Evelyn Gould comes in and talks about ACT therapy, um, acceptance commitment therapy, and this idea of that sometimes we get tunnel vision and we look through this, this pipe and we see something and it is fact. We can see it through the pipe. It is fact, but it doesn't take into account the global picture and that sometimes emotionally we need to take a step back away from the pipe and see that there's a whole world beyond what this is. And for me, that's, that's really how I experienced the first couple of years with autism, that I was seeing how, you know, this much of the world was responding to my child and it was disheartening to me and I wasn't seeing this global, I didn't know it was there. And now I do. And a part of why I know now is because I get access to these people. I don't think I would have known if I just stayed, you know, the mom who was at home working on autism. I don't think I would have known the scope of how many people are working so hard and with so much passion you just would not believe the passion if if i weren't a parent i would i would be going really these people are a little bit frightening to me because they are so excited about what they learn and what they're able to do to teach a child something else it's it's sacred. It's nothing to be made fun of, but the passion is disarming. I said this to Dr. Nadowski yesterday. I don't really get it. If my child didn't have autism, I just don't think this is what I would be passionate about. Of course I'm passionate about because it's my child. Of course. But that doesn't explain all these people who care so deeply about our kids. Who they're, It's not their kids. Um, but they're excited because they know they can help. And that's what I want you to know and that they're there and they are excited to interact with you. This is the other thing that I didn't know. I knew my experience here at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders, which, uh, you know, these people are amazing. And they gave me back my child. So of course, you know, I, I just, I see it in them. But then to go to this conference and see that there is even more, this group of people, and each one of these people that I would run up to and I would, you know, in the hallway and I'd go, I'm sorry, you know, I hate to bother you. You know, I know you're busy and you just gave a lecture, but you know, I'm Shannon Penrod and I host this show called Autism Live and we're there for parents and teachers and we want to give them information. And they would go, oh, I so want to do this. And they were all so very willing and they would say, that's so great. Parents need to be, have more access to more information. That's so wonderful. Um, they were all that way all of them and we ran around like chickens with our heads cut off to get all these interviews from these amazing people to bring back to you and it you know it's not enough it's never enough but that's why we're here three hours live a day because we're just going to keep on talking about it and keep on exposing you to people and you're going to figure out who you know you can hear something 12 times, but sometimes that 13th person says it and the light bulb goes off and you go, okay, that I get. And I completely understand that. And I hope that you stick around long enough so that you, the light bulb goes off for you and you get something. And if it's not going off, tell me, tell me what your issues are. What are the behaviors that you wish you could target? And we'll do some segments on that. Uh, but wandering, huge, huge issue. Elopement, oh my gosh. And it's every parent's nightmare that the child walks off. Ooh, scary, scary, scary. Okay. Uh, so thrilling. And thank you to, uh, Dr. Wayne Fisher, uh, for, and all these other experts that we're going to be showing you, uh, today and uh, coming. So in any case, I promised you an academic tip and, um, I really want to talk about because it's summer, but the summer is already half over. I don't know where to go. Um, but 
w one of the things that we're committed to uh, that we're committed to talking about here is that it's so important to be making progress in the summer or at the very least maintaining the progress that you've made to date we don't want to have that slippage right what we'd really like to see is additional progress to happen in the summer and I've mentioned to you guys that I like to use the skills program at home because it helps me to I it makes it easier for me the teaching points are there the lessons are there I take the assessment I know what kinds of things my son has to work on and I can work on it at a pace that works for our lives um, and one of the different curricular areas that's in the skills program is academic skills there are I want to be hundred percent clear that it is not meant to take the place of an academic curriculum it's meant to bolster and help a child to have that success in an academic setting whether you're homeschooling or you're sending your child to a private school or a public school these are things that help get a child caught up you've got a child who's in fifth grade who is missing some skills that thing that we talk about sometimes Swiss cheese the child who's acting out and having behavior because they're not understanding what they're supposed to do in fifth grade because there's a missing skill that's for a first grader or a second grader that you just need to go back and fill in skills is fabulous for that how about for the child that's three that's behind where they should be and isn't even ready for preschool but we want them to get caught up so that they can go to preschool and be on time for first day of kindergarten that's where my son was you know I I when he was diagnosed at three it was the race against time so that he could go to kindergarten and be caught up by his first day of kindergarten and you know what he was he was caught up and in some cases he was a little bit ahead of the curve because we knew that some things were coming in kindergarten that were going to take him a little longer so we started on them before kindergarten so by the time they got to it in kindergarten and the teacher explained it he got it setting them up for success, right? So there's a whole academic curriculum and skills, and we talk about different things on it uh, that are within that curriculum from time to time. There are two different domains in that curriculum, one for language, one for math, and language arts, I should say. And I wanna talk today a little bit about phonemic awareness. Okay, not an expert not a speech and language pathologist, right? Um, and not somebody, even though I'm an ex-teacher, my expertise was teaching college and a little bit in high school and junior high, but the younger kids, I'll tell you honestly, they scare me. <laughs> I love little kids. I absolutely love them and I love teaching creative things to them. But the whole thing of teaching reading, you know, I'm a, it's a little, I, one of my college roommates was a reading specialist and she would get so excited about teaching decoding and teaching a child, uh, you know, pre-reading and, uh, you know, it always was a little intimidating to me. I'm so thrilled that my son loved the idea of reading and took to reading really well and that I had support because uh, I knew it was not going to be my particular forte. Um, so I'm, I'm talking about this and admittedly saying not an expert, but I do know that for our kids, they have different levels of expressive and receptive language, right? Remember that expressive language, it's all the stuff that goes this way, whether you're pointing to something or you're saying something, it goes from, from the person to another person. It's expressive, they're expressing themselves. Then receptive language is what they receive. It comes this way. Uh, that they understand gestures that people are making, that they understand words that people are saying. And have you ever noticed a child, not necessarily on the spectrum, but maybe on the spectrum, that it seems like there's a little bit of a tape delay that you know somebody says something to them and they're brilliant you know this child is intelligent and brilliant and they can do things and you're just amazed by the things that they can do but somebody says something to them and there is either a big pause or the child you know acts a little like I don't know what to do um, and it can be a very young child or it can be an older child. I have seen this with people who are in college, um, that you say something to them and there, there's a, this, this moment of processing, right? And there are actual processing disorders that can be worked on. Um, but one of the things that we see with receptive language is that there's so many sounds, right? And 
especially if a child is coming late to language and there's a language delay, there is sometimes a difficulty with picking out the different sounds and understanding them receptively. So it's not just, you know, sometimes we think, oh, the child has a hearing issue or it's an attention issue. Sometimes it's not it, it can be some of those things and some of those things combined, but sometimes it's as simple as the fact that they need to train their ear to hear different sounds. And some sounds will be more difficult for them than others. Well, there are a whole set of lessons, really an extensive set of lessons in the academic curriculum about phonemic awareness. Um, and a whole series that gives you the teaching points of how exactly to teach it, but taking uh, little bite-sized amounts and teaching teaching a sound. Now normally when we're teaching the alphabet with a ch child we would be saying okay you know well this is the letter uh, B and it makes the B sound. By the way there's a great video um, it's, oh, of course, now I'm going to have a hard time remembering what it is. Uh, it's called the Alphabet Factory, and it is uh, Leapfrog. That's what it is. Uh, really great because what they do is they give each one of the alphabet characters a character. Um, they each live in a separate room, and this the little frog, uh, Leap, is learning the alphabet, and he goes from room to room with this scientist, and they open up the door for the B room and there are all the B's and they're, they're uh, uppercase B's and lowercase B's and they're all walking around going ba 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 right so we're not only teaching the the letter and what the letter looks like but the sound that it makes and that's a really important thing for us to do to do those hand in hand but for some of our kids when we get to spoken speech sorting out those sounds can be really difficult so phonemic awareness uh, teaching a child to recognize when somebody is speaking and if I I say, um, you know, I'm teaching the z sound, uh, which is difficult because sometimes it's an S and sometimes it's a Z. And I'm saying, you know, which one of these words has a z sound at the end? Is it beds or fish? Right? And for some kids, that right there is so confusing. So we put it in a DTT setting, we teach it to them separately first, set them up for success, and make sure that they can differentiate those sounds. What happens when you do is that suddenly that child starts we, we give them that phonemic awareness and they start to be able to pick words out and understand them quicker. That isn't always the case because I said sometimes there's a processing disorder that also needs to be worked on. But I have seen that this is very amazing that sometimes you've got a child who once you work on these phonemic awareness lessons, it's like a new child that all of a sudden they begin to understand what you're saying. Have you ever been someplace where somebody was speaking and they start to speak and you go, I, seriously, like, were they just speaking English? I, I it's, it comes out and it sounds all garbly and it, it's like a panicky, panicky little moment where you go, I know I'm supposed to be understanding what you're saying, but I'm not. Whether it's that they have a thick accent or they're just using words that have no meaning to you whatsoever. Um, imagine if that was your entire life, your entire life, uh, how frustrating that that would be. And for some of our kids, they really aren't understanding what we're saying. And we make assumptions all the time about, you know, you say something to the child. I remember my son, my mother, when uh, she visited at one point, right as we were about to get the diagnosis, and she was saying to my son, go turn on the light turn on the light, turn on the light. And he just, you know, kind of looked at her and backed away from her. And it was evident to him that she was saying something to him and putting a demand on, but he had no idea what she was saying. And she was pointing, you know, turn on the light. So now he's looking at the light and he didn't know light switch. I, no comprehension whatsoever. He had to learn that. Um, and, and there were certain sounds, there are certain sounds that he still struggles with, uh, but he's gotten so much better. So when somebody says something, his rate of responding is so much quicker. It makes a difference socially. It really does. Really, really does. Uh, so one of the wonderful things that uh, we can work on this phonemic awareness. Okay, 
it is time i've spent so much time on this it's time for the a word this is that wonderful documentary that uh is being made at the center for autism and related disorders following a little boy jack riley this is a short episode this week but short and to the point where we see jack riley and the progress that he has made in terms of getting another person's attention appropriately i discussed this earlier in the week that each family gets to decide what they think is appropriate for this particular family they decided that tapping somebody on the shoulder and saying their name was appropriate for us we decided for him to say excuse me to get people's attention appropriately and then of course eventually we got to the point where we switched it up so that there were many different ways that he could appropriately get attention and i'm sure they're going to do that with jack riley but you always start with something that feels appropriate for your family what what is what you would like uh we're also going to see that he's working on categories uh which is a fascinating thing to me because first he learned different labels and now he's learning learning categories of things which is going to build cognition and build conversational skills so take a look at the a word i know a cute little blue eyed boy and his name is jack jack riley he got a big warm blue eyed soul that makes your heart beat fast Oh, yes! Hi! What's up? Can I help an iPhone? Uh, later. Jack Riley is now gaining attention without prompts. When first teaching a new skill, a therapist does errorless learning, which is prompting a child with a correct response. Four months ago, when gaining attention was taught, Jack Riley needed a gesture, physical, and vocal prompt to do it. As time progressed, less prompting was needed, like using only a gesture prompt or a partial uh, vocal partial. prompt. Sure, which one do you want? Both. Oh. Another skill they have been working on is categories. First, they teach it to him receptively. Give me food. Then they teach it to him expressively, first with prompts. Tell me a furniture. Say a. Uh. A, say a couch. A couch is a furniture. Furniture. Good. So tell me a furniture. Couch is a couch. Say couch is a fern. Furniture. Good. So tell me a furniture. Couch is a furniture. Yeah. And then without. Tell me a food. Okay. A food is your food. Good. Tell me another food. Welcome back. That was the A word. I hope that you're watching this on their YouTube channel. They have their very own YouTube channel and you can watch from the beginning up until the most recent episodes. And we're a little bit behind in terms of episodes that we air here, but I, I can't say enough. And I know I say it a lot and you guys might get sick of hearing it, but there is an arc to ABA. Um, you know, it is putting together a puzzle. I, uh, you know, I know one of the big symbols for autism is the puzzle piece and uh, it, it's apt, right? It, it's accurate that there are missing pieces that we need to plug in for our children. And what you see with ABA, if you see just a snippet of it, you see one little piece of the puzzle being worked on. And sometimes that can be a little, I don't know, misleading. You can look at it and go, I don't really see how that fits in. Um, but then when you see it with more pieces, you begin to realize how truly amazing this is and can be for our children. How you can piece the puzzle together and arrive at a place where the child is just enjoying life. I know, I know for some of you, you're like, really? I just don't know because, uh, you know, that's not my child. I don't see how this can apply to my child. I think I was afraid of that in the beginning, but I so desperately wanted it to be true that I was willing to suspend disbelief, if you will. Uh, but I had doubts. I really was. I'm, I'm such a cynic sometimes. And by the time I got to know about ABA, we were already several months in and I was pretty cynical. Um, but I, uh, did a little bit of research and asked questions and ultimately met a family who were able to show me their child. And when I saw their child, 
I was like, okay. And I said, yeah, but I'm sure your kid started in a different way or he was, you know, he was already, no, mm -mm, no, this was a child who was very profoundly affected. And as I've mentioned before, was saying to his dad, dad, after lunch, can I play video games? Which, you know, to our friends who don't have children on the spectrum seems like such a small thing. But at that moment in time for me, that was everything I could have hoped for, for my child to look at me and say, after lunch, can I play video games? I welled up. I'm welling up now because that to me was a miracle. And, uh, you know, forget it. I, uh, I now the conversations that I have with my child, uh, I I try to every day remember and be grateful, because I didn't know that we were going to have this. But I gotta remind you guys that I wouldn't have it. I I know I would not have it had it not have been for ABA and the months that my child that you know ther the years that therapist came to the door, and sat down with my son and pulled out his logbook and sat down and did something with him at the table. And and then went and played and applied whatever that he, they did at the table while they were playing. And, and you know, so there'd be like one more little piece to the puzzle. And then the next week there would be something else once he mastered that, that they would do. And we would have these milestones that we would meet and catch up. And I would always be like, yay, what's next? What's next? What's next? Because it seemed like it was never ending. And, you know, and I'm very frank with you guys here that my son is not yet recovered from autism. But he gets closer every day, and we are working on things constantly at home still. I use the skills program at home, but every day we get closer to being caught up. And every day he demonstrates to me, and I still sometimes think, oh, we still have a long way to go. We still have a long way to go. Um, but then he demonstrates that while I've been off working on something else, he just figured something else out on his own. He is. He is solving things on his own now. And and I, and I love for you to have an opportunity to see, um, you know, essentially what you can look at now is basically a first year of early intervention online, and you can look at the whole thing. Um, yeah, it's condensed down for you. You're not seeing every single moment, but I, I can tell you as somebody who has been through this, you're seeing a really good representation of what it's like emotionally for the family, what it's like for your home, what the frustrations are of having Having all these strangers in your home, the mm, of parenting by committee, <laughs> you know, and I say that because there, you know, you have your child and you parent, right? You've got relatives who say, oh, you should do this, you should do that, right? Right. But you know that ultimately you're the parent and you can go, well, that's not the choice that we're making. And then you start on this ABA journey and it, it there is a, it's admitting and saying, I cannot do this by myself, I don't know what to do, right? And then you have people who come in and say, okay, this is what we're gonna do. And sometimes, ooh, sometimes just like, mm. now you can always say no. You always, always, always can, but you know what? I think the stuff that's the most frustrating is the stuff that's super duper easy. And you see on this series, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, the dad, was talking about this very frankly. I just, can I tell you, I love both of these parents, but I have a special warm place for the dad because I relate to a lot of the different things that he feels and that he's vocal about. The mom is very peaceful and kind and gentle and loving, and I want to be her when I grow up. Um, but the dad is frustrated sometimes, and I go, oh, I get it, I get it. Um, and there was a moment when they were talking about, because Jack Riley is somebody who doesn't, he's got some aversions to food and he's has some eating issues that they've been working on very, very slowly because that's how you do it effectively. And uh, at one point, the, the supervisor who is Sabrina Tuma, who was my son's supervisor, uh, and Sabrina's, you know, she's one of those people who uh, loves our kids kids and is very calm and even and she's worked with enough kids that she knows that there's going to be progress. She's not worried about that. She's very patient with parents. Again, that very Buddha kind of thing, right? <laughs> 
got me. I, I want to get to the Buddha state. I am not there. I don't know. I don't know. If, uh, I, I'm going to get to the Buddha shape if I keep going, but I don't know if I'm going to get to the Buddha mindset. In any case, I digress. Um, but Sabrina says to him, well, here's what we're going to do to start working on the food issue. It seems like one of the things that he's really reinforced by is watching videos. This child, Jack Riley, loves to watch a cartoon, loves to watch TV, loves his Disney movies, excuse me. And uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to set up a computer with one of his favorite movies on disc in the computer because it's mobile. And... Uh, what we're going to do is put a preferred food in front of him because he will eat applesauce, um, but we're going to put it in front of him and he's already worked on all the skills so that he can self-feed and we're going to set the video there and, you know, when he's eating, we're going to let the video play. If he stops eating, we're going to turn the video off and as soon as he takes a bite, the video comes back on. And this poor family who had been through, you know, a year and a half of struggling to make sure that there's enough nutrition nutrition getting into this child. There's nothing worse, right? And I just stress, stress, stress. And so she said this and he looked at her and <laughs> he shared on the video. He's like, really? Really? That's what's going to work? Really? Because if it was that easy, don't you think we would have done that a year and a half ago? And, and Sabrina's, you know, all calm, cool and collected about it and says, but you know, are you willing to try it? Would you be willing to try it? He says, well, of course I'll try it, but it just can't be that easy. And of course it was. And it it was and it wasn't. It got the child to eat and then the, the it morphed into other things. The intervention morphs into other things, into other foods and so on and so forth. Um, but in any case, it worked and the dad had the real honesty to say, you know what, that ticks me off. That really ticks me off that that is what worked. Well, you know what, that's real. I felt the same way sometimes. I was like, really? Really? That's what's going to work? And then it did and I would go, all right, that just ticks me off. <laughs> Uh, and there, bless, you know, Sabrina, there were times when I'd be like, look, uh, you know, it's not easy parenting by committee. And, and she would go, I know, I know. And, you know, you don't have to do anything that you don't want to do. We're just trying to help you. And I would go, I know that. I know you're trying to help me. And I know you're trying to help my child. But you have emotions. You have emotions while it's happening. And you get to see this in the A word. But you also get to see the progress. And I got to tell you, the progress makes it all worthwhile. It's humbling to let other people come in and work with your child and have them be able to accomplish with your child what you've been banging your head against the wall, right? It's humbling, but we suck it up, right? And let them do it. So check it out. Check out their YouTube channel because it's really a wonderful, wonderful thing on so many different levels. Okay, we're going to take a break and we're going to show you one, another one of the interviews from ABAI. We're going to show you a gentleman that refers to himself as the behavior guy. I guarantee you, you're going to love this. Take a look. Behavior guy. <laughs> and why are you known as the behavior guy? Uh, I, I sort of adopted that moniker after working with parents and teachers who always refer to me that way. Oh, the behavior guy is coming in the classroom, behavior guy is coming to the house today, so might as well own it. Uh, but I'm a board certified behavior analyst. Facebook page is uh, facebook.com, and I think it's slash behavior guy too, and then, uh, but the website is behaviorguy.com, and it's sort of an information portal for people interested in applied behavior analysis, uh, parents, teachers, uh, students, whoever. You have worked for a period of time with kids who have behavior problems that don't necessarily have autism, correct? That's correct. I actually got my start in special education with uh, typically developed children, uh, many of whom had diagnoses like uh, oppositional defiant, conduct disorder, ADHD. Um, so indeed, uh, applied behavior analysis is just a science of human behavior. It happens to be the science of human behavior that informs effective autism treatment, but that is one small tail of the spectrum uh, for which behavioral principles apply. A lot of our parents don't know how effective it is for kids who aren't on the spectrum. When you would use this for kids in the classroom, they're having those behavior problems. How effective was it? Uh, very effective. It really depends on implementation, and that's the hardest thing is getting everybody on board and following through, and that's a, a tough 
a challenge for a practitioner is to get, get teaching the skills to the parents and teachers. Uh, that was something I always focused on. So, you know, my role has always been not to d directly uh, provide services to the child, but to teach parents how to implement these procedures on a daily basis because they're with their children 24 hours a day uh, to give uh, teachers the tools that they need to understand how to assess behavior, how to implement effective teaching skills, effective classroom management skills so that they're always effective. Um, so it's parent training and teacher training and, and giving everybody new skills all around, you know. And now you're doing a lot of training of behaviorists, yes? I do. Actually, I work for the Florida Institute of Technology. We have an online professional development program uh, for individuals who may have degrees in other related fields and want to get that core course content for board certification. Um, so I am a, a, a lead co-instructor for that program and work with uh, uh, the students in, in helping them understand the concepts and, and working with them to uh, gain the skills that they need for board certification. So that was the behavior guide, Corey Robertson, and uh, very fun, uh, you know, it, interesting to meet so many people who were kind and compassionate and also had a sense of humor, because I appreciate that always, and uh, he definitely had a sense of humor, and uh, I loved, in fact, his t-shirt. Did you see it? It said WTF, but underneath it said, what's the function? Because we're always talking about any behavior that's happening has a function. And for challenging behavior with our kids, it always has a function. And unless you know what the function of the behavior is, you're going to risk being inefficient in changing the behavior. So I love the fact, you know, because WTF is something that, you know, uh, means something else to some people but I love the whole idea of what's the function what is the function because uh, I'm always saying function function what's the function you know that uh, uh, after school what was it uh, I can't think what the name of it is but uh, the, the the little song that they would do about conjunction junction what's your function so my whole thing is uh, what's function function what's the function um, so love that and of course you can check out behavior guy on Facebook and online uh, we're, we're hoping to uh, really broaden your mind to how many people out there and how many resources there are out there for you, uh, things that we were connected with while we were at ABAI. And I also want to remind you that while we were at ABAI, I, you know, I had certainly heard a year before, actually, the first time I heard about ABAI. I didn't know that there was a conference that all these board certified behavior analysts went to. And I didn't know till I was there at the international one that they have littler ones throughout our country and other countries uh, all year long. Um, so you can check out, and parents are welcome to come. Uh, it is not a thing where you have to be a board certified behavior analyst. They even have a workshop, and we're going to be showing you a video, I think, next week or the week after, of uh, two women who were at the conference that did a special breakout section session in the morning for parents and for teachers who were not BCBAs to come and get an orientation about how to get the most out of the conference. Really, really fascinating uh, to tell you because you get this book. Can I just tell you? Uh, it, it, I mean, it's like this tome, literally this book, and it has every single talk over a five-day period and a little paragraph about the talk that's going to be giving. given. It's overwhelming. Uh, you know, there, there are like 17 talks going on at any given moment um, and you're having to sort out which one do I want to go to. It was like Disneyland. I'm just telling you. It was just crazy. Uh, crazy good. But I would encourage you that you don't have to go to the big one if you don't want to. You can go to a smaller one closer to you um, and attend that and learn the people who are in the area that you're in. Really worthwhile, I think. Okay, so I wanted to go over your answers to the question of the day. What are you wishing for? And so many of you wrote in. Uh, and... You know, I, I said, what What are you wishing for? Somebody just said uh, to find a cure for autism. Another person saying, I'm wishing to my dream to help others to come true. I want to start a series of shows to raise money for charities such as Autism Speaks and I Have Asperger's Syndrome. How wonderful that you want to raise money. That's fabulous. Another person who says, I'm wishing my daughter will be able to lead a normal life. Uh, another that says that my son leads a productive, happy life in spite 
spite of his disability. And it is that thing, I think, you know, I love Temple Grandin says, uh, not disability, but differently abled. I love that. Uh, another person who says to hear the voice of my sweet angel say, I love you, mommy, uh, for her aggression, self injurious behaviors to vanish for her to live free of ridicule, pointing fingers and whispers. My wishes and prayers are endless for my baby girl and all others who struggle with everyday tasks that others take for granted. You know, I mean, that is the double edged sword that we all have that on the one hand, we don't get the luxury of taking those things for granted. But I got to tell you that isn't that a wonderful thing that we get to see the miracles? We get to see that when a child starts to speak, when a child says, I love you, mommy, in, in the rest of the world, oh, it's a big thing and it's a wonderful thing. It's a different thing in our world. When a child says that for the first time, that's like, you know, stop the presses. Uh, you know, we have phone calls to make and uh, we get down on the ground and laugh and cry and, and everything else. Uh, so in that sense, we do get to uh, experience the miracles in a way that other people don't. I appreciate things in a different way than I did before. I just being honest here. Okay, another person who says, for people to understand that autism is more than just a word. Oh, amen. It means something. Support for my family and friends. Help for them to grow. These are all wishes that they have. Help for them to grow beyond their ignorance. Oh, yeah and learn more about autism. Therefore, they will know and understand that certain behaviors are a part of the disorder, not a personal attack of disrespect on them, a negative reflection of my child's personality or a lack of parenting skills. Yes, I absolutely agree. And uh, then they go on to say more funding to help with much needed services. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Another person says, for all who suffer from autistic and related disorders to find the peace that they so often seem to be missing, the moments when their bodies and minds can be still. Um, and you know what's funny about that? I don't know that I have experienced that with the people that I have met. In fact, quite the contrary. Um, because I, I know a great many adults on the spectrum now or people who were on the spectrum when they were a child and are adults now and no longer qualify for the diagnosis. Um, and I certainly have experienced a lot of children my son's age and slightly older and, and slightly younger, actually. And what's interesting to me is that while there tends to be some anxiety, right, um, that there is also, I don't know, an inner peace that... Uh, seems to me to be missing in the rest of us. And, um, and I know that sometimes, you know, that idea of anxiety and peace, you know, it would seem like they would go hand in hand. I don't, I don't know that that's the case. Um, but what I see in the adults that I know with autism is that they are very self-aware, very self-aware, and that they understand who they are. They just don't understand why nobody else understands who they are. And, and that there is a peace and an acceptance in that that I find really inspirational. So interesting. But, you know, everybody's different, and uh, I only know the people that I know. Uh, but I appreciate your comment. And another person who says, for people not to judge us or our children. Oh, yes. And you know what's hard about that is that I, you know, it's it's crazy because, you know, I get angry sometimes at people for judging me or judging my child. And what I find myself doing in the next breath is judging them. <laughs> you know, and then I catch myself doing it and going, all right. I have to realize that, you know, not everybody knows everything. And there was a period of time when I didn't know. And then I have to get down to work about making sure that I tell the people in my life, look, this is what it is and this is what it isn't. Uh, another person who says, for people to become more educated about autism, the stigma and the judgment to end. Oh, yes. To be treated like a normal person and not someone with autism. Yes. Another person who says, I wish for my boy to talk. Mm. And another person who says, I wish for someone to give me the money for a private school. Oh, I hope that happens. Hey, by the way, 
since you brought up the funding thing, because the funding thing is such a, uh, an important part of things, I want to remind you that today is the 27th of July, and that next week on Wednesday will be the 1st of August, and so you only have a couple of more days, because we only have till the end of the month, for you to apply for grants from Autism Care and Treatment Today. It's www.act-today.org. Go there today, get started on the paperwork. It's going to take you a couple of days to fill it out and get your paperwork together. But you can apply for a grant for things that you need. If you want money to go to a private school, you can apply for a grant. You absolutely can. If you want to apply for a grant for skills or cardio learning or for to get a diagnosis or you need a fence or you need a trampoline or you need an iPad what do you need and this is what they give grants for what a parent needs right so I encourage you go fill out a grant if you need money to help you with copay for ABA if you need money for something else but it's related to your child and them having autism please fill out a grant there is a waiting list I I understand you know it's a tough economy and they are not able to grant to everyone, but they give away a large sum of money to families who need it, and why not you? So fill out the paperwork. I really want to encourage you to do that. Uh, okay, I wanted to go to one of the other sites here really quickly and see some of our um, questions of the day. Sorry, um, I went to the wrong place. I want to remind you that you can be answering this question on Autism Live and that while you're there, we really love it when you like us. Give us a like and uh, we really appreciate, okay, it's not there today or I can't find it. Um, uh, we also have a, a box now that if you'd like to give us your email address, we will send you a monthly newsletter. So that's a wonderful thing too. All right, we are going to take a break. I understand that we have another ABA I interview uh, to show you and uh, we'll talk about that because I don't know which one it is. <laughs> um, so we'll talk about that after the break. Stick with us. <laughs> While science is fundamental in treating autism, currently there are over 400 treatments for autism, most of which are not scientifically validated. So it's absolutely overwhelming for parents to make very critically important treatment choices for their children. And science could be the shining light to help parents uh, differentiate between those interventions that give their kid the best opportunity for success versus those that could um, cause harm or, or not necessarily lead to any type of beneficial treatment outcome. We're always talking about being efficient and effective on the show. And, you know, if it's not science-based, you're not going to know that it's efficient and effective, right? And as a parent, do, do you I, not agree? I don't want to waste a minute of my time, nor do I want to waste my uh, resources or my funds in uh, pursuing treatments that aren't effective. We talk a lot about ABA. I imagine that you're, a, since you're a science-based organization, that you talk about ABA from time to time as well. Absolutely. You know, currently, Applied Behavior Analysis enjoys the largest body of scientific support. Um, so uh, ASAS mission is to disseminate um, scientifically validated information about autism treatment. Currently, Applied Behavior Analysis enjoys the most support. If somebody wants information, and people want information all the time, where could they go to learn what you guys know? We're partial to our own website, of course, at asetonline.org and individuals can sign up for our free newsletter at asatonline.org forward slash sign up. It's a quarterly newsletter. It has book reviews, article synopses, clinical corner, consumer information. Um, it has uh, a variety of information that could really help parents, teachers, consumers really uh, become the most uh, savvy, sophisticated consumer they could possibly be, which is our goal. Do you guys take apart some of the science that, that gets uh, disseminated? Because sometimes I look at a study and I have no idea. Do you guys kind of give us a, a layman's perspective of it? Do you ever do that? Absolutely. We actually just started a, a column called Focus on Science, where we try to help our readers understand like what the peer-reviewed process is like. Um, oftentimes, um, individuals, they talk about like a, a research, but it's not published research. So um, we really want our consumers to be able to understand what it means to be peer reviewed and also to understand that um, you know, five different studies replicating the same type of finding is uh, much more valuable information than one person who might actually benefit financially from their findings. 
you know, so we really want to uh, provide consumers with information about how to really um, understand the, the power of different research findings. But I have to say, though, that it saddens me that parents of kids with autism have to be in this position with that they have to work so hard. No other group, no other parent group has to work so hard to, to access effective treatments for their kids. I agree, and I'm sure you do too. As a parent, what got you involved in this organization? Um, I believed in science and autism treatment, and David hooked me in, and um, they needed help, uh, volunteers, so um, it just no snowballed from there. The people who are on the board of ASAT have a wealth of knowledge, and they volunteer their time. It's, uh, the treatment summaries that are on the website are so helpful to parents. Um, it's, it's an amazing website that's free. I mean, parents don't have to pay anything to access this information. We've been talking a lot today about the transition time and how it's something that we all need to be paying more attention to. But I'm sure, mover and a shaker like you, you'll tell us all when you figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't figured it <laughs> out yet. A generation but. of families 15 years ago that had newly diagnosed children are the generation of parents today who are really trying to develop services for adults, young adults with autism. And you guys are going to have to be pioneers twice. And we didn't have access to ABA uh, 15 years ago. My son didn't receive early intervention, so um, it's very different today, but um, we're still advocating as we have done for how many years. So. ASETonline.org, and the newsletter is ASETonline.org forward slash sign up. And it's all free. Facebook page as well. Oh, Facebook. You need to go and like your Facebook page. Yes. <laughs> we have thousands of fans. Okay, wonderful. So nice to talk to both of you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Welcome back. So that was another one of the interviews that we did at ABAI. ABI Inter is ABA International. Uh, David Celebretti and Barbara, I believe her last name is Wells. Forgive me if it's not. Uh, my memory is terrible, but it is right. Uh, okay, good. And uh, the organization ASAT. And, you know, again, you get into more jargon, right? But if you can remember ASAT, it stands for Autism Science, or excuse me, Association of Aut excuse me, Association of Science and Autism Treatment. That's what it is. Association uh, for Science and Autism Treatment. And a really important, uh, a great clearinghouse of information that you can go to asatonline.org and check out what they have. It's a great website, a wonderful resource. And one of the things that David said in that interview that I really appreciated is, because I don't know about you, I'm so overwhelmed. We see from time to time the media gloms on, especially during Autism Awareness Month, right? In April, every other day, there's a new study that's being published in that month that I, I we hear that sometimes people wait to deliver the study when they know the media is going to cover it I get it but then the, it goes through the media mill and it gets bad out and it looks like something and then when I ask the experts to go back it's nothing like the thing that got spat out and I'm frustrated sometimes because as a parent I don't you know it, it making heads or tails of what comes out uh, it's difficult and I loved what he said about you know when there is more and we've had Dr. Jonathan Tarbox say this to us as well but I love to hear it from different people when there is more than one study that shows that something is effective because a lot of times some of these studies are driven by somebody who's got a product or something that they want to tout so they do a study and there's just the one study that shows oh yeah this thing is effective but the only person who's doing the study is the person who stands to make money off of it and you know I mean I I understand that it, sometimes it's the thing is beneficial but as a parent I, you know, the last thing I want to be is taken advantage of because somebody wants to make a buck on the fact that my kid has autism. Do you know what I'm saying? And, and so I love the idea of using science as a litmus test to say, what does the science say and who's doing the, you know, who is it that's processing these things? Who's behind it? Who's the dollar behind it? That's a question that I like to ask on a regular basis. I know you guys do too. Um, so this is a wonderful organization, and again, the information is free. They're on Facebook, they're online, asatonline.org. Uh, Barbara is a parent that her, her son is in that tran those transition years. He's a teenager, and she works with this organization. There are a lot of parents that do, but disseminating that information in a really clear and concise way to parents. So ASAT, uh, Association of Science and Autism Treatment.
Uh, I, I'll get it eventually. It was a mouthful. And there were so many, <laughs> at these events, there were so many different people. Uh, and there, are, uh, you'll see as you start to see some of these interviews, they have this, this room that's as big as two football fields. And every couple of hours, they'll set up another thing where different people stand in front of a board and you can go and talk to them and so you know right where to go to meet those people uh, so hundreds of people milling around and hundreds of people that you can go and have conversation and everybody has an anagram for their name and uh, right jargon city <laughs> Um, um, and I kept on saying, I don't know what that, uh, what that is. What is ASAT? And then they would tell me about 300 times that it was not sticking. It was that time of the evening where nothing was sticking. Uh, but so wonderful to meet them. And they were so excited to be able to talk and give the information for you guys. So we really want to thank them. Hey, it's time for the IEP tip of the week. And, uh, you know, it's summer. And, and so we didn't do one for the last couple of weeks. But it's a good time. Uh, this time of year to take out your IEP. We talked about this a little bit with Dr. Adele Nadowski yesterday that you got your IEP, which comes on that, you know, that form with the boxes and so on and so forth. And on the top of your IEP, it has a little box that says BIP attached, right? And there's either a check mark or there isn't. If you've got a child on the autism spectrum who is engaging in any challenging behavior, if there is anything at all going on that is challenging in the classroom, Room, that box should be checked and that BIP the BIP should be attached to that IEP. Now is a good time as we're in the middle of the summer to just know where your IEP is. Um, I, you know, early on here in the state of California, there's an organization that does free seminars and they give you a binder. It's the most wonderful thing and it has the tabs already in it that they suggest that a parent with autism have. And one of them is a place to be able to put the, uh, the diagnosis from the pediatrician and to have your child's current IEP in another tab. Um, and, there, and it comes with, it's the most wonderful thing, it comes with a hole punch that attaches to the, goes in a three ring binder, so that you get papers and you put, you hole punch and you put them in. Now, I, you know, I had, I had the book that they gave me and I used it for two years and then we outgrew it because it got like this. Um, and of course, if you go on Autism Speak site and you go to their first hundred days, one of the things that they encourage you to get, I couldn't have afforded it, but um, if you can, I can definitely see the benefit in it, is to invest in a scanner that you can take a stack of papers and just put it there and, and it feeds itself through and it scans uh, stuff, documents immediately and life-changing. Can I just tell you, they're expensive. I still don't have one, but I the, the paper that comes with autism can overwhelm you and put you under a pile so easily. And then when you got to find the paper for the, you know, this and so meeting, but be a pack rat, save it all. It made a huge difference for me, and I know other people, it made a huge difference of what services you end up getting. Because when you have the paper on the day, to be able to say, here's the paper and document everything, everything, right? Um, but in any case, know where your IEP is today, whether you tape a folder to the wall and say, here are the important autism papers, uh, and here is the IEP, or you make a file folder uh, on your computer desk or in an actual non-virtual actual file cabinet, or you have one of these books, whatever you do, but know where your IEP is on a regular basis, right? And this week is a good time to sit down and read through it. Read through it, know what it is, know what it says, um, and especially read through that BIP. And if there is not a BIP, I would be sending that email today saying, hey, I wanna to get together with the IEP team to set up a BIP meeting for whatever the challenging behavior. If you got any kind of a notice last year in school or you know over the summer that your child is, whatever it is, that your child is not getting their work done, is you know uh, falling out of their seat, is biting somebody, is engaging in in aggression um, of any kind is falling asleep. I, you know, whatever, if there is anything that you have gotten a note from teacher or aid or something, there should be a behavior intervention plan. 
right? Um, if there are lots of behaviors, you want to make sure what are the ones that have the potential to have your child moved to another setting. And those are the ones you want to target first. Actually, let me amend that. The things that you want to target first are anything that's self-injurious or injurious to other people. And then you want to make sure, well, but that's one of the things that can get your child placement moved. Um, but it, and then throughout the year, if anything comes up, you're going to send an email and say, we need to add, we need an FBA done. We need to add this to the behavior intervention plan. FBA, again, functional behavior assessment. So, but now is the ideal time. Take the IEP out, look through it be up on that. That's one of the ways that you're going to be the most efficient, most effective person on your child's team. Yes, it hurts your head, it hurts my head. It's miserable, but be up on it. Understand what it says, know what it says. And I'm saying that to myself as much to you, that I got I got things I got to do on my child's IEP. Uh, <laughs> If you're watching from my son's school, yes, I know. I've got things i got to do. Okay, so uh, in any case, but take it out. Look at it. Ha know where it is so that when school starts on day one, you know where it is and that you don't have it memorized, but you know exactly where to find it so you can read through it again on a regular basis. It is your child's roadmap to success. It's a legal document that uh, ensures that your child gets the proper implementation of behavior modification and the kinds of things that they're going to be learning and the criteria with which they're going to determine whether they're being successful. Really super important. Okay, it's time to take a break. I know that we have another ABAI interview to show and I don't know what this one is either. So we're going to look at it and talk about it afterwards. Take a look. We're the state's largest autism-specific advocacy agency. We're almost 50 years old. We started with a group of parents almost five decades ago who needed help, needed answers. And now we're, uh, again, the state's largest nonprofit agency serving autism specific, is addressing autism specific issues. One of the things we do is share information and parents are desperate for credible and reliable information that leads to real services. So for decades, Autism New Jersey has had a 1-800-4-AUTISM number where anyone can call, but not just parents, professionals too. And you can ask a question about autism or you can ask for an autism service. Uh, we'll work you through our website. And to be included in our resource directory, you actually have to have the support of at least two other parents or two professionals who say, yeah, you were helpful and you were credible and you were reliable. Mm -hmm. And going forward, if we hear from more than one parent or professional that maybe your services didn't meet their expectations, we'll investigate that. Parents need access to credible and reliable information 24-7, so we have a website, okay. www.autismnj.org, okay. and we have the 1-800-4-AUTISM, and that's the number 4, 1-800-4-AUTISM. Okay. Wonderful. And when they call that number, who do they get? We're so excited. You get a compassionate, knowledgeable expert on autism, autism services, autism resources. But two of them just happen to be parents themselves of children with Asperger's and autism. And the third person is a professional who's a trained advocate. So you can't miss by dialing 1-800-4-AUTISM. Unfortunately, right now, we are business hours during the week because of funding cutback. Well, that makes sense. I mean, I was going to be amazed if you were 24-7. But we do have a partner called Mom to Mom in the state of New Jersey. And I'm so sorry I don't have that number with me right now. We'll I'll, find I'll, Mom to Mom is a 24-7 helpline. And when you dial that number 24-7, um, they'll be able to respond within seven seconds wow. of hearing the phone ring. And they'll refer to us if it can wait. Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm loving, you know, I get all excited again. We had such a good time at ABAI in Seattle, and Emily Goodwin and I went up, and man, we worked. <laughs> 
<laughs> endless hours. Poor Emily. I, I ran her feet off. I ran my own feet off. Seriously, this was a couple of months ago, and my feet are still killing me. Um, it was that much uh, running around. But, you know, I get so excited because we met so many wonderful people. Linda, Linda Meyer, one of them. I was so excited to meet her. You know, one of the things that I wanted to do there, and I got to do it a little bit, but not enough. And, uh, you know, in the future, I'm, I keep in mind, if you're watching this wherever you are, that this is one of the things that I want to do, is I wanted to connect with people in different places in the world and in different states so that when somebody writes in with a question and says, hey, you know, I'm looking for services in New Jersey, that not only can I say, okay, here's a great website to go to, here's a person. Here's a person who really, and Linda Meyer, Autism New Jersey, uh, what a wonderful resource. And to see her, and she was so excited about the kinds of things that they're doing and with good reason, uh, because they, they're they doing a tremendous job and it's something that we can all learn from. Uh, uh, you know, there are a lot of different people in different states and, and people do it in different ways in different states, but I love the model that they have going on in New Jersey so that there is a place for people to call and that they kind of have this sort of, it's like Angie's List, you know, that uh, if you have an autism service that you can be on their site, but you have to be recommended by two people and if you get any negative comments, you're out. <laughs> like a zero tolerance policy. You gotta love that. And I really wanna thank uh, Matt Scheller for, he's been editing these videos for us and that we came back with so many of them, which is why it's been a while uh, in, in the making of getting these videos up and to you. But uh, I love that, uh, and I was just watching that one for the first time and the fact that he got that Moms for Moms site for us. So thank you to Matt for doing such a wonderful job. There's so many people who care you guys uh, and some of them you're going to be seeing and then some of them are behind the scenes but I want to make sure that you know that there are so many people who care about getting you this information it's like a warm bath don't you love it I do because I know that somebody out there watching needs that information and now you can be hooked up with some people who really care about what it is you're trying to do uh, and I love that free service and it can for parents for teachers because they look here's the thing we've got a bunch of information and people want to give it to you how great is that okay i promised that we were going to talk about a social tip today and I do want to take a couple of minutes to talk about social skills because in a little while at the top of the hour we're going to be joined by Dr. Jonathan Tarbox and he is going to talk to us a little bit about what the criteria for the diagnosis is and we know that a part of that is social skills that our children do have a deficit in certain areas of social skills and they're not all going to be the same our kids are going to be different but we can strengthen those and in light of all the things this week you know I thought uh, what, a, what a great thing to to talk about some of the lighter aspects of social skills like humor and telling jokes that sometimes for our kids they don't have an understanding of humor because humor if you stop and think about it um, first of all there's a general knowledge base that our kids may not be aware of but humor also deals with those fine lines those things that take uh, perspective taking and figures of speech into uh, consideration and um, so there are a lot of different things that kids need to be able to learn before they understand and then there's the whole idea of humor and how do you tell a joke well what I love about this is that we can teach it you know uh, I, I admit it I used to do stand-up uh, I wasn't the best stand-up comedian but I used to do stand-up and I find humor interesting you know I'm not a big math person but there is a certain amount of math to humor and there there are studies that have been done on humor that um, uh, where I grew up, there was a whole uh, building of scientists who were studying the science of laughter and what makes people laugh. You gotta think, that's gotta be a fascinating life to lead, right? <laughs> to be a scientist studying the science of laughter and what makes people laugh. Um, but I kind of find that interesting myself, how if you change one word, uh, it's funnier than if you don't change the word, or if you say it a little bit faster, you know, what makes something funny? And I'm always excited to talk about that and I love that my son is at a point and because of his ABA uh, therapy that he had and and that we continue with using the skills program um, 
there are a whole set of lessons on humor and telling jokes and he finds that very reinforcing we a few years ago in my community they have a group a support group that i i am not active in and i uh, you know i offer apologies for that but when my son was little the time that they had the meetings i could never go because he had therapy and i was always running to ot and it's mostly a meet in person group and it, that wasn't conducive for me so the groups that i used were online and over the years you know they did some events and i i went to some of the events um and I, you know, I talk with them from time to time, but they're, it just doesn't jive, you know? But it's a wonderful organization that does a lot of great things. And a couple of years ago, they did a talent show and said, we want to give an opportunity for all of our kids to be able to shine. Now, uh, my son, they had a, a, a art and Lego display where they asked kids to, you know, do whatever they wanted to do and display it. And my son participated in that way. But we went and wanted to support the show. At that point in time, my son, there's no way that he could have gotten up on stage and done something. It just, it wouldn't have happened. He was not that far along. But he could make a Lego thing and we made a whole display for him to be in the in the art and Lego show. But we went as audience members with him to watch the other kids. Can I just tell you that it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing for him to see these kids who had a diagnosis like him and he knew that he had shared a diagnosis with these kids. For him to see see what they could do bumped up he saw it was very reinforcing and all the kids who were in the show got a trophy he still talks about that still talks about that to this day now they haven't done another show but he has been preparing for a show that they're going to do at some point ever since then and one of the children got up and told jokes and it just happened to be at the period of time in which we were starting to take on some of the lessons for humor and telling jokes recognizing humor and responding appropriately to humor and being able to tell a joke and so it is, has been ever since it was just one of those kismet timing things but my son is fascinated with humor now and fascinated with telling jokes but I share this because there is a social element and it so there is it within the curriculum skills curriculum there is a whole section on humor and telling jokes we absolutely can take these lessons and apply them in a very creative way to our individual child to help them to understand there are a lot of prerequisites right because those figures of speech and those kinds of things um, um, but for them to understand what's funny and what isn't funny, it's an ongoing thing and everybody has a different sense of humor and for a child to understand that their sense of humor is different from somebody else's sense of humor, guess what? You're at perspective taking. Um, so it is a wonderful thing and it really helps with friends. Um, that this is one of those social skills to understand when a friend is joking with you or doing playful teasing that's jokeful, that's not bullying right to understand the difference between that to be able to tell a joke it's a little bit of an icebreaker now for my son that we recently I've, I've shared before that I have a friend from college that her son was diagnosed with autism and back then I didn't get it I was not a good supportive friend I've apologized for it um, but I you know I didn't I didn't get it I just didn't get it and she recently came to visit and have brunch with us with her new fiance and uh, my son was so excited we were sitting at the table and he said hey would anybody like to tell a joke that was his icebreaker for the conversation at the brunch and so they got into this whole thing of telling jokes uh him and the new fiance and it was a wonderful way to begin you know what could have been a socially difficult thing for a nine-year-old to sit with people that he doesn't really know and that are asking him a lot of questions and he was getting a little overwhelmed by it and he's like hey anybody want to hear a joke and he has a couple of jokes in his arsenal and he's always adding other jokes and when something happens on TV and he says to me was that funny why is that funny and uh, and then there are some things that he just finds hilarious uh, and and has a total appreciation for and he's constantly making up jokes but humor is something that we can teach which is a wonderful thing you may have heard from people oh you can't teach humor humor you can't teach timing I'm here to tell you that's not the truth uh, so you absolutely 
can teach humor and timing and all of those things, but the appreciation of the humor as well. To understand there are times now, there was just the other day that there was a joke on television, I can't remember what it was, but it was a double entendre. And it was uh, uh, using a, a phrase that my son had never heard. And he said, I don't get it. I don't get the joke. And then we were able to explain to him, oh, well, in some cases, this means this. And in other cases, it means this. And, and, and just the other day, we were in a grocery store and I was explaining to him malaprops, uh, that when you use a word that sounds like something else, uh, but you're using the wrong word and how sometimes that's funny. Um, so, uh, you know, it opens up this whole other arena that's quite reinforcing for them. So I encourage you uh, to work on some of the lessons on humor and telling jokes. It's a wonderful social thing that helps our child, our children, to be able to uh, interact with peers and others. Fabulous thing. All right, we're going to take a short break um, and we're going to come back and start to address a couple of these questions that you guys wrote in. Uh, when we had Holly Robinson Pete, and then at the top of the hour, we are going to be joined by Dr. Jonathan Tarbox. So stick with us. Currently in the United States, one in 88 children is affected by autism. One in 88 means something different when your child is the one. Recovery is possible. Hi, I'm Shannon Penrod, host of Autism Live, an online show about autism broadcast by CARD, the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. I'm also the mother of a child with autism, my beautiful son, Jem. You know our old joke, guess what? Chicken butt. Chicken butt. So we're gonna take the chickens. But things weren't always so easy. I remember when Jem was first diagnosed with autism. I used to lay awake at night in bed and pray for someone or something that could help us to get our child back. My prayers were answered by Dr. Doreen Grandpichet and the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. CARD treats autism and other related disorders using the principles of ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis, which is the only scientifically proven effective treatment for autism. It is also recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics and the U.S. Surgeon General. About a year after we started treatment with CARD, we were able to see tremendous improvement and we got our child back. What grade are you in? Second. You are a smart cookie, huh? Mm -hmm. Do you like school? Uh, yeah. Do you have any good friends? Yeah, Oscar. Oscar is your best friend? Yeah. And my child is just one of thousands to benefit from CARD ABA therapy. Across the nation and around the world, children are making amazing progress and being given the keys to unlock their full potential. We are extremely grateful for the amazing job CARD has done in helping our daughter. Our daughter today, just in four months, I think is a totally different child than when she started with CARD. I kind of see it as, it, it seems like her brain in a way was asleep and now that we've gotten so many services, um, we've seen her wake up. Did you have some gases? <laughs> Recovery is possible if you take the right steps, um, if you're willing to put in all the hard work and seven and a half years, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. It's worth every little bit and um, Card's been there with us every step of the way. I have two children with autism. I can't imagine a day without CARD or the therapists. Um, they've been so instrumental in helping us with our kids and, and shaping their lives and helping us help them. Thank you, Christy and Big Alex. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie and Mariana. We've tried other things before ABA, but the most beneficial thing has been ABA services, and I'd be the first person to tell any newly diagnosed family that you have to you have to contact an ABA provider. And if you're lucky enough to have CARD, you're very blessed. Recovery from autism is absolutely a possibility. We've been recovering children for over 20 years. It's just a matter of identifying the child's medical needs, understanding the child's sensory issues, and then teaching the child all of the skills they need in order to function normally. We know there's hope for autism. 
Autism is treatable and recovery from autism is possible. Welcome back to Autism Live. Of course, you just saw a bunch of pictures of my Bubby, uh, amongst other children in there. And, uh, it, you know, it's an emotional subject. It tears me up. I see some of those pictures and it takes me right back to how I felt on those days and how I didn't know where we were going to end up. You know, and I know there are many of you watching that you're in a place, and, and we're going to address some of these questions that you guys sent the other day really quickly, um, that you don't know. You don't know where, and I just want to remind you that it's okay to not know where you're going to end up. I know it doesn't feel like it, but it is okay. But what we need to focus on is making progress. All of our kids are different. They're all going to get to different places because they're all starting in different places and they have different skill sets. They have different deficits. But what I want us all to remember every day is that progress is available for all of them. We just have to get started. And I do promise you that once you, as hard as it is right now, uh, once you get started, it's, it's not like it's going to get miraculously easy, right? But when you start to see progress, everything does get easier. You get into a rhythm where you say, this is what we're doing and things change things do change. It does get better. That was one of the things you guys asked the other day when Holly Robinson Pete was here. Does it get better? Uh, yes, it does get better if we make the choice to be on our child's team, to advocate for them, and to make sure that we're getting quality ABA therapy in the right amount. Um, when we do that, we're going to see that we're going to increase skills that the child didn't have before and we're going to decrease some of that challenging behavior it does get better it's amazing i refer to it as the autism miracle in my living room uh so that's how i feel about it one of the other things that you guys asked the other day and that holly said you know she started answering this question and she said i gotta be honest i'm in the teen years i don't know so much about this anymore but you guys asked about are there uh any good ways to help autistic children to focus are there games that help any ideas would be great and I want, you, I want to remind you, all kids are different. There are so many things. The list is overwhelming. But in the coming week, we're going to start to address some of these things and give you some ideas of how to help with focus. But I, I want to remind you that a good place to start is what is your child interested in? Is there something that they're particularly interested in? We talked yesterday about memory and that... You know, there are lots of different ways to work on memory, but one of the things that can be reinforcing for some children is that memory game. But you notice if you go to the, the toy store now that the, the toy builders understand that kids have things that are more reinforcing to them than others. That's why there's a memory game for SpongeBob, and that's why there's a memory game for the Disney princesses, and that's why there's a, you know, a memory game for Dora the Explorer, because if the child finds what the stimuli is, and that's what the little cards are, the stimuli, if they find it interesting, they're going to be more likely to overcome some of the challenges because they're going to find it reinforcing. So ask yourself, what is my kid particularly interested in and how can I use that to get them to focus? I was just talking a second ago with Peter Farrig, who I love and adore and was the first therapist to ever show up to our door. And one of the things that they did early on with my son to help him to get eye contact was that they would have paper sword fights because my son wanted to be a pirate. He loved Peter Pan and the whole idea of sword fighting that and that got him to focus. And, and I've shared this before on the show. They would sword fight, sword fight. And then Peter would freeze like just like a statue freeze. And my son, you would be this conundrum. He wouldn't, Peter wouldn't say anything. He didn't say, look at my eyes. None of that in the beginning. But my son, it was like, you know, I was just having so much fun. This was just so good. How do I get this ride to turn back on? And at some point, his eyes would cross Peter's, and as soon as Peter would have even a millisecond of eye contact, he would start fighting again. And I, but gradually, you know, he would wait a little bit longer. He'd get that eye contact, and he would start again. And so, without having said a word, what he did was help my son to begin begin to focus because my son realized it was worthwhile that the good things happened if he made eye contact. 
of course that lesson built and continues to build right but in those first early moments what he taught him was oh you look here and the ride starts the lights go on the party happens so when we're teaching a child focus I, I think any that time we're teaching something that's already difficult for our children we always want to start with something that's reinforcing I've said this before Take your child to the toy store. Put put them in the cart, put toys in the cart, see what they love. What do they want to come back to? Uh, th don't have to buy anything the first time. See what they're really interested in. Take them to somebody else's house. See what toy they play with. Um, there are lots of games out there, but the question is, you could go and spend thousands of dollars on toys, but what does your child find reinforcing? That's where you're gonna get them to focus. Um, uh, is when it's something that they're really interested in and that's going to be different for all of our kids because our kids are different uh, so keep that in mind when you're looking for games and toys that are going to help them to focus all right we're going to take a really quick break and then we're going to be back with dr jonathan tarbox stick with us is a revolutionary web-based program that incorporates comprehensive assessment, curriculum design, progress tracking, and treatment evaluation for children with autism all in one place. Developed by the Center for Autism and Related Disorders, our approach is based on over 40 years of research on the principles of learning and their application to improving the lives of children with autism. How does skills work? Created with speed and simplicity in mind, Skills was modeled on an easy three-step process. Step 1. Start Assessment Step 1 begins with our Intelligent Assessment System, which consists of a series of questions. This assessment is essential to identifying your child's level of skills compared to their typical peers across all areas of development. This includes assessing social, motor, language, adaptive, play, cognition, executive functions, and academic skills. Every skill has an assigned age which indicates when the skill emerges during typical development. This means that each child is automatically presented only with lessons that are relevant to his or her age. Step 2. Choosing Activities It's now easier than ever to build an individualized treatment plan. In Step 2, you are presented with an individualized pool of activities that are directly linked to your student's assessment results. Each activity represents a specific skill that has been indicated by the assessment as needing to be taught. Activities are categorized by curriculum and then by lesson. There are three main types of skills, building blocks, fundamental, and expansion skills. Fundamental skills are necessary for successful everyday functioning. Building blocks are prerequisites to a fundamental skill. Expansion skills are non-essential skills, but may provide further enrichment in certain areas. After reviewing the activities available to you, you can quickly add your chosen activities to the treatment plan by simply checking the box and clicking the button. Step 3. Start Treatment Once you have selected and added the activities you want, you are ready to begin teaching. Skills provide you with all the tools necessary to design and manage an effective curriculum plan, such as printable activity guides that are customizable by the teacher, supplemental teaching aids including printable data sheets, teaching guides, visual aids, worksheets and tracking forms, detailed IEP goals and benchmarks for each activity, brief and visually appealing video tutorials, 
a variety of treatment progress and clinical timeline charts, and lots more. And since Skills is completely web-based, everything you need is available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, in one easy-to-access location. Skills users even benefit from unlimited access to a support community where they can ask questions and share ideas with a skills expert. Skills is always with you. Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. We're webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters in Tarzana, California. And it's Friday at 11 o'clock, so our special guest, I'm so thrilled that we have, we're back to this point because I've been away, but we have Dr. Jonathan Tarbox, who is the Head of Research and Development here at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. And you also have another title now, too. Tell us about what that is. Uh, yes, uh, so I'm also the Executive Director of Autism Research Group. For ARG. Which is wonderful. Yeah, thank you very much. We're a nonprofit dedicated to doing research that uh, makes a real life difference in families uh, living with autism. You gotta love that. And are you still having a survey on your site for parents? Yeah, it's to, still available. Uh, yep. Okay, so tell them which, where they need to go and what they'll be doing when they get there. Sure, absolutely. So this is part of our parent generated research initiative, and uh, it involves um, basing the topics of our research on what parents specifically ask us to do research on. Okay. Uh, we figure that um, parents know know probably as well as any, uh, probably better than anybody, what the real life challenges are on a daily basis for their children and for the family unit as a whole. So. Uh, we really want uh, feedback from mm -hmm. folks. So folks, uh, if you have a, a child on the autism spectrum uh, or a family member, please go to um, www.autismresearchgroup.org um, and scroll down to where it says Parent Generated Research Initiative and uh, click the link and it'll bring you to a survey. Um, and it basically won't take you more than five or 10 minutes and it essentially asks you to uh, prioritize what matters the most to you uh, in terms of research so parents can have their voices heard. And we're already starting to develop specific research studies um, on the basis of those surveys. Which is wonderful. And so for those of you watching at home, stop and think about any time that you've ever heard about a research study and said, you know, why aren't they doing research about this? I, one of my favorite phrases, well, nobody asked me. <laughs> and then you come along and you're asking me now. So, uh, so you take advantage of it. Take advantage of it. Now, we meet with you every Friday that we can. And um, there are different things that we're going to talk about today. But one of the things I specifically asked that I wanted to talk about is because, as you guys know, Joe Scarborough, earlier this week, he hosts the Morning Joe program on MSNBC, made some comments. They were talking about this tragedy that happened, the shooting at the movie theater in Aurora, Colorado. And Joe, who is the parent of a son who is on the autism spectrum, and he identified himself as that as he was talking about it, said, uh, essentially, he said, well, you know, it's unfortunate, and we don't really know, and I don't want to generalize and I think that would have been a good place to stop, but he didn't. Uh, he said, you know, when I hear, when I heard this, I knew exactly what we were talking about. We were talking about a white young man from an affluent neighbor who's, uh, neighborhood who's probably on the autism scale. Scale is the word he used. And he went on to say, you know, these kids who have, a, a, they don't have a, co a connection to the community, um, don't have, you know, so society does not mean the same thing to them, and that he said, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm a parent, uh, but my son has a support system, he has, he's loved, he's cared for, and, you know, but some of these kids aren't. And it's, it's such a huge, ignorant leap to have made, and of course it's created a firestorm. Um, people have, have been writing on Facebook that, you know, Holly Robinson Pete said that somebody said to her at her son's summer school the other day, my gosh, are you worried that this is the kind of thing that your son might do? Oh and people People are saying that you know they're they're at the water cooler and this is what people are talking about um, and I don't think that I don't think that Joe realizes how bad such a comment like that how far it goes but it, uh, you know I'm shocked by it because I'm familiar with the with what the diagnosis is for autism I don't know what the diagnosis is for a sociopath or a psychopath right but I know that these two things are like completely exclusive of, of each other That's correct. Um, and but I want somebody who is more knowledgeable 
knowledgeable than I am that has, you know, some letters before their name and after <laughs> their name to so that people don't think it's just me saying okay. that. So talk to us about what the actual criteria for autism is sure. and 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 why because we know there's a social component to it, but it has nothing Absolutely. to do with these homicidal behaviors right. that Joe so ignorantly misspoke about. I'm worried for him. He's a parent. To be this ignorant is is just really devastating. Well, and you know, it's 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 entirely possible that he didn't really intend to make that jump in quite such a simplistic way. We don't really know. Um, I'd be interested to Thank hear you what for he has pointing that out. It's possible. We, I mean, well, you know, what he we did know, what he did say was I'm sorry if people took it wrong. Yeah. Well, and so, you know, I have to say I'm not an expert on spree killers or sociopaths. Right. Um, and I'm also not an expert on diagnosis per se. I don't diagnose. I'm a, right. a behavior analyst, not a licensed psychologist or a medical doctor. I'm a behavior doctor. Uh, but I do treat all of these symptoms uh, that the right. diagnosis is based on and do research on all of them as well. Um, so I'd be happy to talk about it. Um, as far as I know, there's no evidence uh, whatsoever to suggest that um, individuals with autism are more likely to engage in crazy spree killings than anyone else. Um, that's really a totally separate phenomenon. Um, so as far as I know, it's, it's a totally unreasonable leap to make. And of course, we don't want to go around diagnosing people when we really, frankly, don't know anything about exactly. Um, about the case. And quite frankly, a reporter shouldn't go around diagnosing anyone ever, even right. if they knew every single detail of the person's life. Right. So deciding that someone has an autism spectrum disorder is, is a fairly serious professional um, diagnostic act. It's not sort of something we can just sort of casually throw around. Right. I mean, people joke around all the time, oh, maybe Bill Gates, you know, has Asperger's or whatever. Um, but, you know, it's kind of a little bit more serious when we're talking about someone who, um, you know, committed one of these unspeakable acts. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a, a quite a bit of a stretch, I would say. Uh, but so, would you like to uh, go over some of the? I would like to go criteria? over and it's, and uh, the the different the three different areas and specifically talking about the social, sure. uh, so that people understand, it, if nothing else, that our parents be informed so that they can inform other people. Sure. Um, so first of all, there's nothing in the diagnostic uh, criteria for autism that talks about aggressive behavior at all. At all. So aggressive behavior is not part of the autism diagnosis. We do uh, often see children with autism uh, who have difficulty communicating will engage in disruptive behavior, tantrums, mm -hmm. occasionally hitting, kicking, pinching, things mm -hmm. like that. But, uh, but that's not part of the autism diagnosis. That's a secondary result of not having basic communication skills. Right. So, you know, to to jump from you know tan having a tantrum in a classroom to shooting up a movie theater mm -hmm. and thinking that you're the Joker in from Batman is bonkers. There's no connection. Right. So, all right. As far as the uh, uh, diagnostic criteria go, here I'm going to refer to my notes. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, basically, to get a diagnosis of autistic disorder, and we should back up one minute here. Um, so, the autism spectrum consists of autistic disorder, which is the most severe form. Right. PDD NOS, or pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, which is a little bit less severe or develops later in life. Okay. And then Asperger's disorder, which is generally considered the least severe form of autism. Right. Okay? So, to get a diagnosis of autistic disorder, the most severe form, you have to display at least six symptoms across three different symptoms. Areas. And the okay. three areas that we, your viewers are probably familiar with are communication, mm -hmm. socialization, and then repetitive behavior or interests. Right. All right. So, so I say it's like a, like a Chinese menu. You've got to have right. some from column A, some from column B, and some from column C. That's They're right. different and criteria of how many. That's right. And, and you need to have a total of six or more. Okay. okay. So uh, first of all, from the social uh, interaction or social adjustment uh, part of the Chinese menu, right. uh, you need to have at least two symptoms. Okay. And so here they are. So the first symptom is marked impairment in the use of multiple nonverbal behaviors, such as eye-to-eye -eye gaze, so mm -hmm. eye contact, facial expressions, mm -hmm. body postures, and gestures, but here's the important part, to regulate social interaction. Okay. So it's not just someone who doesn't make eye contact enough, it's a child who um, uh, either isn't able to or, or doesn't use eye contact in order to help have a successful social interaction with friends. Which is a really important distinction to make because some people go, oh, well, the child can make eye contact. Right. But that's not enough. They have that's to use enough. it to be able to be communicating in a social situation. That's right. And things like facial expressions um, are, you know, subtle but incredibly important in everyday yeah. social interaction. So even, you know, starting around maybe first, second, third grade even, <coughs> um, children's uh, social interactions are highly regulated by their facial expressions. So, for example, if, you know, if you and I are 
are you know second graders or third graders hanging out on the playground, and uh, <coughs> and I start talking about a particular topic, and you make a facial. Uh, <coughs> you okay? No, I'm joking. <laughs> oh, no. I'm sorry. Call nine one one. We may need to take a break. Let's do that. All right, let's take let's a break. Take a and break. Come back. <coughs> we'll be right back. <coughs> Here I stand, a man, someone who has overcome struggles, someone who has endured perceptions of what others thought of him, thinking he was stupid because he was autistic, or simply believing him to be nothing because he was different to them in their minds. But I stood my ground. I just wanted to say to the organization in general, Alongside helping me to improve communicatively and socially, the other greatest gifts you gave me were the value of discipline and a good work ethic. To quote Anthony Kiedis, to celebrate you is greater now that I can. You helped me to realize that the harder you work, the likely you are to achieve success. Having had to work very, very hard to recover from autism, this discipline has continued to serve me well. I also realized that you taught me a lot about and instilled within me a quality of having compassion and sympathy for other people. That you will be concerned more with the needs and wishes of others than with your own is something that I awe and I constantly strive to be. And in closing, the only way I can sum up card for all of you is love. Everything you do to help families in need, you do out of the sheer love of wanting to make a positive difference in people's lives. And as I stand here before you as a mature adult, I have to say that I'm extremely grateful for your unwavering loving commitments to helping others and me recover from potential life roadblocks and become active and contributing members of society. While I can't overcome obstacles without a will, I cannot have a will without the love of those supporting me. And without love, I am nothing. Thanks again so very much for your love. Everything that you've done and continue to do, please give my best wishes to your families, everybody else with Cardi wasn't here, and especially all of your clients and their kids. I'm confident that they too will be able to overcome, and I know that they'll be successful with what they do as long as they continue to put their minds, hearts, passions, and best efforts into it. Enough said. Welcome back. I'm sorry, I had a tickle, and uh, there was nothing we could do about it. So Just had to we, cough we, it out. <laughs> you know, and I, don't, and I don't know that it's done, but we'll see. <clears throat> But anyway, I so rudely interrupted you. You were talking about the criteria for a diagnosis of an autism. Right. Okay. Right. And we're discussing the social domain, which is the most important. Mm -hmm. So for autism, for autistic disorder, you have to have six symptoms with at right. least two from the social domain. Okay. So the, the first one is qualitative impairment, uh, I'm sorry, uh, marked impairment in the use of uh, multiple nonverbal behaviors such as eye contact, facial expression, body posture. So for example, uh, as young as maybe second grade, third grade, if you and I are on the playground and I start talking to you about a particular topic that I'm really interested in, but then you make a facial expression that indicates you're not interested in that anymore right. or you're bored or angry or disgusted or tired or whatever. Or choking, or choking like just right? what just happened. Um, uh -huh. then it's important that I'm able to to respond to that, yeah. and, that and change f topics or ask you, hey, do you want to go do something else? Right. And it's important that I'm able to use facial expressions to regulate uh, my interactions as well. So right. it, it goes <laughs> both ways. Um, failure to develop peer relations appropriate to the d uh, developmental level of the kid. And so that's kind of one of the more obvious things. Right. Uh, essentially, does the child have friends? Yeah. Um, and as a child gets older, it's uh, it becomes more and more typical to have close friends and a best friend at some mm -hmm. point, perhaps a group of friends. And so what we'll see oftentimes is, is children aren't you know developing peer right. relationships. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> The third symptom is a lack of spontaneous seeking to share enjoyment, interests, or achievements with other people by a lack of showing, bringing, or pointing out objects of interest. So this is oftentimes talked about as joint attention. Right. So if something is interesting to me, do I then try to recruit you to get interested in it too? So right. if a loud noise happens, do I look at the loud noise and then look at you? Right. Or if I get a new toy that I really love, do I come and talk to you about it and share right. it with you or, or get you into it? Um, and that's so, one of those things that I think it's easy for parents to miss. It is. 
um, because Especially if it's if not it's there, yeah, yeah, and if it's not your first child, but that idea of, you know, are they looking at you to see what your reaction is and kind of gauging their, and when they're really little, gauging their reaction off of yours. That's right. So the dog comes and barks and you're frightened <clears throat> of the dog and so they're they're frightened of the dog. They mm -hmm. don't know to be frightened of a dog except for our reaction of it. That's right, yeah. Um, but when it's not there, that joint attention. It's easy to miss. It, it just is very like easy to miss it. It's just kind of doing okay on their own. Right, they're really still happy-go-lucky, yeah. right, but right. you know. So it's easy to miss. <clears throat> yeah. And then the fourth uh, symptom in the area of social interaction is lack of social or emotional reciprocity. Mm -hmm. So this one is a little more vague, harder to define, but it's sort of the back and forth dance that social interactions in typically developing folks um, are sort of characterized by, right? right? So if you and I are gonna have a good social interaction, it's not just me lecturing to you. Right. <laughs> it's, it's going back and forth. I'm interested in what you're saying. You're interested right. in what I'm saying. Even kids as young as, you know, six, seven uh, years old, they adjust their behavior to their peers' behavior. Right. And so when they're playing, they do interact. It's not just one kid being the boss, for right. example. I feel like this is sort of where we're getting hung up this week is on this particular one because mm -hmm. what we see sometimes with kids on the spectrum and with Asperger's in particular is that somebody can be upset mm -hmm. and the kid with autism or the Asperger's is not really paying attention to the fact that that person is upset and they're not upset they're finding it funny right. there's there's no uh, you know empathy mm -hmm. that's happening and it can be very frustrating for a parent Absolutely. and <clears throat> excuse me so easy to see where someone could mistake that for something that is something completely different to somebody who is you know, engaging in behavior that is socially uh, beyond the realm of not having empathy. That's right. So for a, a, a parent who's got someone with Asperger's and they're seeing that element of, you know, okay, their friend is crying because their friend just got hurt and they're sitting there, they're laughing while their friend is crying, how upsetting that is, right? But that is not the same thing as being somebody who opens fire. No, absolutely not. And in <clears throat> fact, uh, and again, I'm not an expert on uh, uh, antisocial personality disorder and sociopaths. Right. Uh, but, Nor am I. But, um, but one thing that I, that I am aware of is oftentimes in folks with, that, with those disorders, um, they will actually be aware of of other people's perspectives. In fact, they may even be able to fake it perfectly, mm -hmm. uh, but they don't care. And okay. so there's a lack of an emotional connection, which is somewhat similar, mm -hmm. but there isn't a lack of perspective taking necessarily. Okay. Oftentimes these folks can identify exactly how someone else is feeling, okay. and then they can even use that information to manipulate them. All right. Um, so it's it's quite different from the child with Asperger's who really <clears throat> just doesn't even get it, where you know doesn't even understand where others are right. coming from. And since we've taken the time to talk about these things, why not take a moment to educate can we do anything about these deficits for a child who does have this diagnosis of autism? Oh yeah, absolutely. And so we have, um, you know, the ABA approach to everything is inherently practical. We just teach it. We we uh, assume everything's a skill that can be taught, essentially. Mm -hmm. So we take all of these uh, areas of functioning and we break them down into, okay, what is the child actually doing? Mm -hmm. And in what context, in what setting? Uh, what cues does a child need to cue into in order mm -hmm. to um, gain all of this information? And so um, perspective Perspective taking pretty much always involves uh, identifying external cues that are highly correlated or very likely related to someone's internal states. Okay, so explain for, to me what that means. Okay, absolutely. <laughs> so the simplest case would be just um, uh, emotional facial expressions. So okay. when you smile, I'm observing you smile. Mm -hmm. I'm not actually observing you be happy, okay. but it's so frequent that people smile when they're happy Got that it. that's a cue I use to figure out, oh, she must be happy because she's okay. smiling. Okay, all right. So um, angry, you know, sad and happy are the most obvious ones. And they're right. the first first ones that, that folks learn. And I think actually even in autism, people are pretty familiar with the ability to teach those. That's, that's oh, yeah. pretty easy to teach. <clears throat> There's a, a million and one decks, uh, decks of you know flashcards you can use to teach right. those. Um, but you know there are some people who don't think that, don't know that you can. Right. Yeah. Literally. That's, but you can. You yeah. so can. And that's not even, honestly, that's not even new. That's been, that's been right. done for 30 years in, right. in ABA. That's not even, I mean, it, it, it's impressive that it's, that it's you know, it's teachable yeah. and learnable, but mm -hmm. it's old hat. 
things yeah. in ABA. And so then the more complex things involve things like, um, you know, understanding other people's intentions or right. understanding other people's uh, more subtle uh, emotions like um, disappointment, mm -hmm. let's say, or frustration or mm -hmm. jealousy. Right. And so identifying those emotions still depends on uh, looking at um, uh, overt cues, mm -hmm. external cues, like facial expression, mm -hmm. but then other more complex things too, like what did the person, um, what other overt behaviors did the person just engage in? So uh, how do you know whether someone did something on purpose? or, uh, or um, unintentionally, right, okay, accidentally. Yeah. So it involves uh, detecting someone else's intentions. Right. A lot of it has to do with um, overt verbal behaviors, like if someone trips and then knocks into you, right. that's probably <clears throat> unintentional, right? Mm -hmm. Although they could be tricking you, it's possible. Right. Um, whereas if someone doesn't trip and speeds up and bumps into you, that's more likely to be intentional. Right. And so all of these um, complex areas of perspective taking involve giving the child lots and lots of practice okay. with clear feedback and uh, even giving rules. You know, when something is like this, then it's a good clue that you should, you know, the person might feel like that. Right. Um, and then lots of practice clear feedback and then practice across a lot of different settings with a lot of different people yeah. um, on different days. You know, no, we're not talking about rote memorization here. We're right. talking about lots and lots of practice, just like in, in any other difficult skill you'd want to learn. And making it fun. And Oh, that's the most important thing, yeah. of course, making it fun yeah. and making sure that the child's paying attention and is interested. You yeah. know? And we know how to do that. Some, you know, uh, for some children, they already just want to learn and, yeah. and just the teacher's approval or the parent's approval is enough and that's awesome. That's right. great. Uh, if that's not the case, then you might have to contrive some other uh, right. motivators, you know, things like maybe like points or, um, you know, extra time on the computer right. or, you know, I, I don't or know. Or making it like a to game. McDonald's. Making it a game. Making Absolutely. a game that, you know, we're being Sherlock Holmes and putting on special exactly. hats and we're looking for cue, clues. That's I mean, right. you know, blues clues. It's that kind of thing, you know? That's exactly right. There's a good book <clears throat> called uh, Social Detectives and mm -hmm. it's um, it's all about this stuff. It's all about under awesome. social understanding and it's sort of a comic book format and, uh, and it teaches children children how to sort of uh, figure out these clues uh, in terms right. of how other people feel. Right. And so, you know, one can go through a book like that with, with a student or, or a child and basically practice. Uh, it's going to require a lot more practice, though. It's not as simple yeah. as just reading a book. But. Yeah. Well, and we've talked a little bit before about when you get to the teenage years because uh, these are kinds of things that all of us could strengthen. Absolutely. It's not just our kids on the autism spectrum. And then when we get into the teenage years, we've had a couple of different times that we've talked about the clues and the cues that mm -hmm. go between teenagers because then it turns into a whole other realm and, and we see a lot of the teenagers come back and say can you give me cues to know when she says this when she's texting texting me what do they really and, mean? and anytime I yeah what do they mean and what is yeah. it what does it mean when a girl says this what does it mean when a guy says this and what's funny is that when we start talking about writing down what the cues mean everybody wants to know they go well I'd like to know what yeah, that means that's right. <laughs> you yeah. know and especially for us adults we're actually already probably 10 years behind on the social oh. media Media stuff like texting or Facebook or any of that. I don't really know. I need, oh. I need to learn that myself. <laughs> Please. That's what I keep saying. I say I, I need somebody to write that book so that I can read it first before my son is a teenager That's so I right. at least know. But it's going to change every six yeah, months too. Yeah, it'll be too. outdated. Yeah. <sighs> scary okay so that's that's the the social area right mm -hmm. there so that mm -hmm. we can get an understanding that it might mean that our child has a, a, a lesser ability a deficit in social perspective taking but that doesn't mean that they can't be taught Absolutely. and it doesn't mean that they're going to be homicidal that's exactly or right. even aggressive no uh, aggression is not part of the autism diagnosis okay and but we know that some kids with autism are going to engage in aggression but that's a form of communication. Right. And in 100% of cases, it's treatable. Got that? Did everybody hear that? 100% of cases, it's treatable. It's not okay. going to be easy to treat. It's not going to. You're not going to fix it overnight. Right. But in 100% of cases, aggression serves a purpose. It's communication. It's right. functional for the child. And if you can identify the function, it's not that hard to teach the child a different way to get what they want. You know, what we just played a little while ago was from ABAI, the interview that we did with Corey Robertson, mm. and he had on the T-shirt that said WTF. 
if, what's the what's function? What's the function? Yeah, love that's great. It. <laughs> love the t-shirt. Okay, so that's one area, and they have to have a, a, at least a minimum of two things from that social from group. that area. Okay. Yeah, two out of those four. Uh, let's briefly discuss what the other two areas are. Sure. Since we're here, since we might here. as well. Since Absolutely. we're here. Absolutely. Okay. All right, so then next is uh, communication or language. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've got to have at least one symptom out of these four in language. Uh, the first is uh, delay in or total lack of the development of spoken language. And so this is sort of the classic uh, severely affected kid mm -hmm. that we're thinking about here that simply isn't learning how to talk or right. communicate through words. Um, but by that, that's by no means um, every child on the spectrum, right. right? So there's plenty of kids with autistic disorder who do indeed learn some words, um, but they might sort of be non-functional. It might right. be mostly repetition. Um, it, it, they're not able to communicate to get their basic needs and wants met through, through spoken language. Absolutely. And let's remember, you only have to have one from this criteria. That's so right. this is one of the things. One and of let's yeah. continue to read. The next one is individuals <clears throat> with adequate speech, mm -hmm. there's plenty of them, uh, marked impairment in the ability to initiate or sustain a conversation with others. Okay. And so there's lots, there's, well, not lots, there's a, a small but significant percentage of, of children with autistic disorder mm -hmm. who are high functioning autism. Mm -hmm. And these are the kids who um, may actually have age appropriate or even advanced level right. language development. Uh, if you did, if you gave a standardized test that simply measures things like vocabulary mm -hmm. and uh, understanding and comprehension of language, mm -hmm. okay. But um, the key here is not whether or not they're developing language, but can they use it socially and is it is it functional socially? Right. And so what you'll find is a lot of these kids um, have uh, advanced language, but it sometimes is even too advanced and it right. actually alienates them from the other children. So they're right. not able to use that language uh, to have a you know an age appropriate conversation. They can monologue, yeah, but absolutely. the back and right. forth is, is difficult or not there. That's right. Okay, important to note. And then the next one is stereotyped or repetitive use of language or idiosyncratic language. And right. so, you know, again, on the more severely affected side, this could be things like repeating the same sound over and over, right. vocal stereotypy. Could be um, repeating um, scripts from movies. We see a lot movie of that, talk. of course, movie talk. We actually had a question about that during the Holly Robinson Pete interview that somebody said, my child frequently engages in this and what kinds of things can I do? So what uh, I know, you know, I'm, I'm hitting you with this out of nowhere, but you know, there are things that can help to treat that movie talk Absolutely. kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and so, do you want me to comment on it? Yeah, I would, if you can, if you sure, would. Sure, sure, oh, sure. fabulous. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, movie talk is a form of, um, usually, often a form of automatically reinforced vocal stereotypy, okay. which means the reason why the child is engaging in the movie talk is because he likes doing it. It right. produces its own reinforcement. Feels okay. good, basically. Yeah. Um, it's essentially, you can think of it as a habit or even just sort of a maladaptive leisure skill. So we're, and, and we kind of can relate to that because sometimes we talk to ourselves, something's, absolutely. something's That's happening exactly right. and you're trying to do something, you go, no, 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 right. you know, and why? Right. What purpose does it serve? It's just making us, we like saying, ah. Exactly. I mean, it's it's almost uh, like a less adaptive form of daydreaming, right? So okay. where you or I might sit around and think about something, mm -hmm. um, a child with autism who engages in a lot of uh, scripting, uh, instead of just sitting around and thinking about it, because mm -hmm. maybe they don't know that that's a more appropriate form mm -hmm. of, uh, of behavior, instead they're going to just repeat the script over and over okay. out loud, okay. um, which, you know, does uh, make them, you know, stand out more. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be disruptive to yeah. if they're doing it in class. Um, and, and it so, can drive everybody around them crazy. It can drive Let's everyone around that, them crazy. Let's say that, you know, because yeah. as a parent, you just go, you know, seriously, you got to stop that. That's right. Uh, and and <clears> if it's part, I mean, if it happens frequently enough, then it gets in the way of the child's um, opportunity to do anything else with their words. Absolutely. Right? And so it can interfere with other just, you know, family interactions and social interactions. Yeah. So the way that we deal with that is the same way we deal with any other behavior in ABA that we want to target for reduction. Mm -hmm. The first thing we do is think about the function. What is the kid getting out of it? Okay. In this case, if it's automatically reinforced, they're getting some kind of satisfaction out of it, some kind of automatic reinforcement. And then we think about a more appropriate replacement behavior. Okay. So a great replacement behavior Behavior. Let's say a kid's obsessed with a particular movie. A great mm -hmm. replacement behavior would be talking to someone else about the movie. Okay. Right? Right. Uh, because mm -hmm. that still allows them to think about and talk about the preferred movie. Right. But it's more socially adaptive because then it's getting them engaged with their family members, siblings, or peers. Right. Um, 
Uh, of course, you probably don't want to talk about exactly the same movie over and over because then that in itself becomes a form of stereotypy, right? right? right. So then you probably <clears throat> want to encourage, uh, through prompting and reinforcement, talking about other topics. Maybe uh, you could even start with baby steps. So let's say it's a Thomas the Train movie. Well, maybe we could talk about now a Thomas the Train cartoon or okay. a different Thomas the Train movie, Good point. right? And you can increase or you can encourage variability like that simply right. by reinforcing, prompting and reinforcing a larger variety of whatever the behavior is. Awesome. As you're making progress with that, then maybe sneak in a little bit different topic the right. next day, right? Right. Um, and, you know, it's it's baby steps. Um, I will say decreasing automatically reinforced behavior in folks with autism is very challenging. And I will say in the majority of cases, you probably won't eliminate the desire to engage mm -hmm. in some kind of repetitive behavior. Mm -hmm. Probably what you're <clears throat> going to do is establish more adaptive ways to do it. Right. So, for example, you know, I'm obsessed with mountain climbing, but mm -hmm. I don't talk to everyone I run into on a daily basis about mountain climbing because they'd all go nuts, you know, if right, that's all right. I ever talked about. So I read a magazine about mountain climbing. I watch a DVD about mountain climbing. Mm -hmm. uh, I read a book in my own spare time. Uh, and I make sure that I talk about other topics, right, right. When, I'm, when I'm hanging out with my friends or coworkers. So um, it's, it's essentially the same idea. It's just that with folks on the spectrum, you might uh, it might require a lot longer to work mm -hmm. on these things, and it might require more repeated practice and prompting and reinforcement. And it's not good enough to just tell the kid, I'm sick of you talking about that topic, right. cut it out. That doesn't work. That's not good enough. Right. It, it requires uh, a lot more attention than that. Okay. And sometimes, well, we haven't gotten to the repetitive behaviors yet, so I'll leave, I'll leave that to, uh, for the. In fact, why don't we take a break and we'll come back and talk about the repetitive and restrictive behaviors. Sounds good. All right. We'll be right back more with Dr. Jonathan Th Tarabox, excuse me, after these messages. <coughs> Hi, I'm Shannon Penrive, and this is my son, Jem. We're here today at the Home Depot. You might know that Home Depot is famous for giving free classes to adults on lots of things like tiling and other home crafts. Well, they also have free classes for kids as well. It's called the Kids Workshop. We love doing that, don't we, Jem? Yeah. It's cool. So come on inside with us, and let's do a craft. Yay. The Kids Workshop is a program that's been around with Home Depot um, almost since we've been a company and it's been developed to allow kids in the community to come in and give them an opportunity to build something, to be able to create something and uh, be able to take just simple wood pieces and put them together with nails and hammers and screwdrivers and then paint them. So you do this every first Saturday of the month. Any Home Depot that you go to on the first Saturday of every month between 9 and 12, you can join uh, different associates throughout different stores and, and build these projects with these kids. And do they have to do anything before? beforehand or can they just show up on that Saturday? All they need to do is show up. We, we have all the tools, all the, the materials that the kids will need. We have aprons that we give to the kids that they can take home and uh, maintain their pins. They get pins on a regular basis for completing projects. With that, they can keep track of how many projects they've done. And, uh, and it's all free? It's all absolutely free. All Which provided. is wonderful. And absolutely. Wilson, I have to say, you know, you, you guys devise this for all kids to be able to do this. Correct. What I particularly love about it as an autism mom, it gives my child a place to come and learn a new skill to socialize with kids of all kinds. Absolutely. And that's what we're here for. Home Depot is definitely um, loves to be involved with the community and bring the community in to work with us. That's what we love to do. Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. Uh, we just showed the Home Depot Kids Workshop. That won't be this weekend. It'll be the following weekend on those Saturday mornings. Can't say enough how fabulous those are. I hope you'll take your child. It's free. It's a great chance to socialize, interact, work on fine motor skills. Uh, and they get reinforced for it. They give them an apron. They give them a pin. They give them a certificate. And did I mention it's free? Love Home Depot. My son loves to go to those things. Really, really good time. But right now we are here with Dr. Jonathan Tarbox and we're talking about the diagnostic criteria for autism. We talked about the first two areas. We talked about the social component and we talked about the communication component. And so now let's talk a little bit about the restrictive and repetitive behaviors. All right. And just like the communication and socialization components, um, the restrictive and repetitive behavior component varies a lot depending on the child, right? Yeah. And so you can have a child who's severely affected by autism who spends almost all of their waking hours engaged in repetitive motor behavior or mm -hmm. vocal behavior, um, all the way up to an individual with Asperger's disorder who um, 
doesn't engage in any physical stereotypy at all, nothing that's observable overtly, um, but will only talk about the same topic over and over, right. or is uh, so obsessed with, um, you know, let's say, engine statistics that that's the right. only thing that he'll spend his time doing, and so right. that interferes socially. Yeah. Um, so again, for autism, for di a diagnosis of autistic disorder, you need um, at least one of these uh, following symptoms. Okay. So the first one is encompassing preoccupation with one or more stereotyped and restricted patterns of interest that is abnormal either in intensity or focus. So again, sort of being obsessed with a particular um, topic or mm -hmm. particular um, interest. Mm -hmm. And so that runs the gamut. You know, folks right. on the spectrum are interested in all the same things the rest of us are. Right. The only difference is um, it, it's the level or intensity is such that it gets in the way, uh, it interferes with their quality of life, basically. Right. right. It isn't necessarily, it doesn't have to be a horrible thing, but when it interferes, then we really need to look at it. Well, that's exactly right. And so people talk about things like like um, you know, social media addiction or video game addiction, mm -hmm. where you've got these teenagers literally spending 12 hours a day on Facebook or on a right. video game online, a role-playing game or something, and that becomes a really significant problem right. if and when it happens so much that it interferes with other aspects of their life. Yeah. So they're not able to maintain normal friendships, they're not able to keep a job or something like right. that. And so of course video game addiction is not necessarily part of autism, but um, it's just an example of it, you know, having a particularly obsessive interest isn't a problem unless and until it's it becomes clinically significant because right. it gets in the way of other things. Right. And I think as a parent, what I try to remind myself is that because uh, my son engages in uh, stereotypy, he makes noises. Mm -hmm. He likes high pitched noises. Even before he saw Star Wars, he was making R two D two noises. <laughs> he just makes little. <laughs> I can't even do it. It's so yeah. high up in in a yeah. register in his head and a sinus in the back of his head. Yeah. 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 Um, and so when he's happy about something, if you say, you know, oh, do we want to go to the park? And he'll make a little mm -mm -mm noise, right? And this is not the end of the world, although some right. some kids think it's odd and, and weird. And my thing always as a parent was not that he never make those noises again, but that we talk about when it's appropriate. That's exactly right. And you know, just like the person who, the executive who's at the top of his field and clicks the pen right. when he's thinking to come up with the idea that, that gets them the million dollar deal, but he's not doing it right. when he's in the meeting with the client. Giving a presentation. Right. Exactly right. You know, it's exactly, the, again, it's a sort of a common sense criteria. It's, yeah. Uh, in what, in which context is it going to be problematic for you? Yeah. And at what sort of overall amount is it going to be problematic for you? Right. Um, you know, I've worked with plenty of families who, um, you know, have taught their kids that it's totally fine to go, um, you know, have, I forget what they call it, stim time or something yeah. in the bathroom or in your bedroom yep. when you're by yourself. Go make a bunch of weird noises or yeah. be obsessed with your particular topic. Who cares? Yeah. You know, as long as it's not interfering with, you know, overall uh, quality of life. Yeah. I digress, but for me it's the same thing like, you know, picking your nose or mm -hmm. having your hand in your pants. I, I make right. a policy of saying to my son, you know, that is your equipment in your pants and you get to do with it <laughs> what right. you will, but only behind closed doors. You don't that's do right. that when I'm there, you don't do that when somebody else yeah. is there. And so, yeah, you don't you know, pick your nose in class, you go right. in the bathroom and blow your nose. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, exactly. you know, that's when and how we do these things when exactly. and when it's appropriate. Same idea. Yeah. All right, so the next uh, symptom in the area of repetitive behavior is apparently inflexible adherence to specific non-functional routines or rituals. So okay. we see a lot of that. Yeah. Right? This is those kids who you have to go the same way to school every morning or there's right. a meltdown. That's right. Or even, you know, when you walk around a table, uh, you know, a kitchen table, you have to do it clockwise or you right. have to do it counterclockwise. And right. if you try to uh, uh, change that at all, then it becomes problematic. Right. And on Wednesdays, we have green beans and we can't right. have green beans on any other day. That's right. And yeah. the green beans can't touch, you know, I, I mean, it gets into a whole bunch yeah. of different things and there are lots of shades to these things. Oh, yeah, absolutely. As well. But, absolutely. you know, I think uh, a lot of people on the outside go, well, you know, my kid doesn't like the green beans to touch their meat, too. Yeah, but when your child is having a full-on meltdown with it, that's a different that's thing. That's different, right. And so, for example, you know, um, yeah, like you said, every child probably doesn't like the foods to touch or probably mm -hmm. has preferences, don't, you know, they yeah. don't really like vegetables that much. But if they're put in a situation where they have to deal with it, a typical kid will just kind of grin and bear it. You know, right. they'll do their best, maybe even be a little bit annoying, but it won't right. be a huge meltdown. Right. Uh, whereas a lot of kids that I've worked with, you know, if they're put in a situation like that, they just oh, can't function and that's like that. everything yeah. stops. That's right. Yeah. We get into full Gandhi maneuver where they're like civil disobedience <laughs> on the, my friend calls it spaghetti legs, uh, right. but I call it the Gandhi maneuver. You know, when they 
just lay down and yeah. it doesn't matter, you know, they're not participating. Right, it's it's that's like right. moved in. You recognize it when you see it. Right. Uh, when they've moved into a, a category of, you know, it's not a choice for them at that point. Absolutely. And so you can imagine, you know, if a kid like that um, goes to a friend's birthday party, for mm. example, and they serve pizza where there's meat and vegetables touching or something, right. and then, you know. Right. So uh, these are all important things to work on. Right. Um, okay. The third one, uh, third symptom in the area of repetitive behavior mm -hmm. and interests is stereotyped and repetitive, uh, repetitive motor manners. So, for example, things like hand or finger flapping, twisting, or complex right. whole body movements. And right. those are sort of more this, the, no pun intended, but the stereotypical ones that people think of with right. autism, right? So Toe walking. rocking, hand flapping, things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, but those things in and of themselves do not mean autism. That's right, yeah. Uh, Absolutely. So, you know, difficult. I think what's interesting is that when you go through these things and people hear like, oh, wait a minute, that's me or that's my child or whatever. But we go back to this idea that you got to have a total of six, total of six yeah. two from the uh, social, social one, one, one a minimum from communication and one a minimum from this uh, stereotype respi restrictive uh, behaviors. That's okay. right. Exactly. And then the last uh, symptom in the area of repetitive behavior is persistent preoccupation with parts of objects. Right. So the classic one we see is a kid picking up a truck and turning it over and spinning the wheels. They're yeah. only interested in the wheels or, yeah. or um, only interested in the shoes that the figurines are wearing or yeah. you know, things like that. Yeah. And we see kids looking at things in a very interesting and peculiar way that, you know, they're holding things up, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to get a different look at them. It's very interesting. Uh, and, you know, uh, when people talk about some of the strengths associated with autism, mm -hmm. this micro focus on seemingly irrelevant details mm -hmm. can actually be a strength in the Absolutely. workplace if you're doing, the, especially in computer programming and yeah. different areas of problem solving, it requires a, a, just a laser focus Absolutely. on details that you know, the rest of us just can't even imagine paying that much attention to. Absolutely. When Suzanne, Suzanne Oshinsky, who is the filmmaker on the A Word, but um, she works here and does other things as well, she interviewed Temple Grandin. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've had an uh, opportunity to listen to that interview. And, and it was right after the tsunami that took out the nuclear power plant right. in Japan. And Temple said, I can tell you right now, if somebody with autism had designed that plant, that would never have happened. <laughs> and she said, I can, I, she said, I can picture it in my mind's eye where these things were and the water coming in. She said that would have never happened with somebody with autism. And uh, I think that's important to remember that these things can be turned into strengths when we allow them to and when we take a moment to look and say, how is it holding the child back and how can we work on that creatively? That's right. And again, it's the same basic common sense approach that we would take uh, with typically developing <clears throat> children. Absolutely. If they have special talents or abilities or, or, or really uh, special interests, that's yes. fantastic. And you cultivate those. But in ways that help the child be more independent and, Absolutely. Uh, and be more functional and, and, and adaptive in their day-to-day -day life. Absolutely. So we have the basics of these three criteria now and got to have a total of six, as we mentioned, two from the social, at least one from the communication, and at least one from the restrictive. But there are a couple of other elements that go with the diagnosis as well that are outside Correct. those uh, things. So can we talk about those briefly? Absolutely. So. Um, uh, first of all, you have to have problems in these areas before the child turns three. Okay. So if none of these issues show up until after three years old, they're not going to qualify for a diagnosis of autistic disorder. And that's right now because we see with the DSM-5, we don't know exactly what it's going to be, but when the, in the perspective that they showed us in the uh, last couple of months, they're talking about tweaking that just a little bit to say unless it is a skill that does not become socially right. relevant until later on in That's life. That's right. And you, what you'll see is with a lot of um, a lot of children with Asperger's disorder, they'll start uh, displaying challenges in socialization later on yeah. after three because the frankly social skills that three-year-olds display are not that complex, right. not that hard. Right. And they and, could, so, and they were able to negotiate it. That's right. They're able three. to kind of fake it or sort right. of get through it or right. or you know learn uh, social skills up to maybe three or four-year-old level and right. then as socialization becomes more complex complex and requires more subtlety and more perspective taking, um, that's where issues can really start to arise. Okay. And what else? 
Um, and then, of course, that the uh, disturbance is not better accounted for by Rett's disorder or childhood disintegrative disorder. Rett's disorder is a genetic disorder on the right. autism spectrum, very, very rare. Um, uh, we don't meet a lot of kids with Rett's disorder. Mm -hmm. And then childhood disintegrative disorder is um, very, very rarely diagnosed. It's sort of, uh, a, it sort of maps on to regressive autism, but okay. frankly, the diagnosis is almost never used. So okay. Probably don't need it. Uh, and, and I don't think it's even included in the DSM-5. I, I don't, don't believe I it don't is. I, or, or it might even be put into a whole different category or something okay. like that. Um, so this is what the criteria is it for autism. doesn't look anything autism. like being antisocial personality disorder right. or sociopath. Right. Which is not to say, I mean, you know, along with, I mean, somebody can have an autism uh, diagnosis and also have something else. Uh, you know, somebody can have Down syndrome and autism. Uh, you know, correct. you can have multiple different things. I'm not an expert, but I'm not sure if you actually can have antisocial personality disorder and autism. I think okay. if you have antisocial personality disorder, it might actually cancel out the autism. But I'm, okay. I'm not sure. I, and I don't know. But in any case, uh, I, you know, and I'm not an expert in these things, but... I know that what was said uh, was really misleading and ignorant. And so I wanted to at least clear up, this is what autism is. Um, and you can see that nowhere on there does it say anything that, you know, the person will harm themselves or other people. Is it possible that a person with autism has, uh, you know, will harm themselves? Yes, but that goes along with other things. That's right. Um, and we see actually the research that's been talked about all week long is that far more often people with autism are uh, hurt by people in society than they hurt other people. Oh, yeah, Statistically, no, no it's, question about it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for clarifying that. And I, we wanted to take a couple minutes because we're getting close to the end, but you went and attended something really incredible this week that you wanted to take a minute to talk about, right? Or was it last Sure, week? yeah, a couple weeks ago. Okay. It, was, it was actually Friday the 13th, ah. <laughs> July 13th in Sacramento. Um, it was for, it was a task force that was put together to put into effect the recent um, autism insurance legislation that right. went into effect July 1st. And so they put together a task force, uh, and the task force, the job of the task force was to answer uh, a large variety of questions, um, some of them having to do with how autism uh, treatment is going to be covered by medical insurance, some of it having to do with who should be qualified to bill insurance for autism treatment. Uh, and so they asked a panel of experts to, uh, the task force put together an additional panel of experts that were were um, researchers and clinicians in autism treatment. Wonderful. And so several of us were brought up to Sacramento and basically testified uh, to the task force on a variety of questions. Wonderful. I, that sounds absolutely fascinating because, you know, we, we see that we've already got the insurance reform, but everybody's got a lot of questions. I absolutely. think there are more questions than answers. Well, and the variability between different providers is terrifying. I mean, yeah. I, I, you know, I have uh, colleagues at other uh, treatment provision agencies that are saying they can't get insurance to cover anything, and then really? yeah, and then we here at Card and and then other folks that I know at other agencies, no problem at all, full coverage wow. immediately. So it's really interesting. That's terrifying. Um, it's really terrifying, and so of course you know. Uh, God forbid you're one of the families that is with a provider that, you know, can't get insurance to cover your kid's treatment. And then at the same time, the regional centers and school districts are saying, right. all right, you great. Insurance, We're off the so hook. You have insurance. You right. Know? Um, so it's it's still a very, very complicated situation, and it seems like it's changing every day. But this task force was put together to make recommendations mm -hmm. for how these things can be ironed out and set in stone. And so far, it looks like the task force is going in a good direction. Great. And so you were asked to testify. Mm -hmm. And what did you attend? Testified to? Well, they had a number of different questions. Okay. Um, basically, they were interested in looking at issues related to consumer safety, mm -hmm. uh, so keeping um, families living with autism and children with autism safe mm -hmm. uh, and making sure that they get the best quality of service. And then issues related to professional competence. Mm -hmm. So um, again, who should be qualified? Can you know? Can anyone just hang you know hang up their hat and say, "Hey, I know how to treat autism and bill insurance"? Right. Of course not, right? That'd be right. ridiculous. If you go into um, a hospital to Day, and you get uh, medical treatment from a variety of different professionals, mm -hmm. each one of those professionals is a licensed professional in their discipline. Right. So for example, the, you know, the surgeon is, uh, is a licensed medical doctor right. and board certified in whatever uh, surgical specialty he does. Right. The, uh, the nurse is a licensed professional nurse. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the medical assistant, the social worker, right. uh, if you see a speech therapist, all of those disciplines are licensed. They have a, a state licensure process for right. their individual 
medical discipline that's separate from other disciplines. Medical insurance will generally not reimburse treatment provided by someone who is not licensed. Right. And the reason for that is state licensure establishes a higher degree of accountability for the professional because there's a state board um, that, that monitors ethical complaints mm -hmm. and that can remove your license if you're not practicing right. ethically. Right. And the reason why that matters so much is because uh, it, it actually becomes state law um, to you that, that you are not allowed to provide the services that your discipline provides mm -hmm. unless you're licensed. So for example, right now in the state of Arizona, they already have a licensure law for behavior analysts. Okay. Today, it is illegal to call yourself a behavior analyst. It's against state law unless you actually are licensed as a behavior okay. analyst. Great. So same thing with the psychologist. Here in California, if you're not a licensed psychologist, you may not call yourself a psychologist and you may not offer psychological services. That is illegal, wow. uh, which is great, right? Yeah. So it protects, it protects consumers from quacks essentially right. um, and so the same process is happening here and so what we were talking about were sort of what the qualifications are for someone to be a licensed behavior analyst um, and what the process should look like um, and you know lucky for our discipline we already have board certification for behavior mm -hmm. analysts which is BCBA right uh, and so what states have done that are implementing licensure for, for behavior analysts is basically start with that that's a great start and yeah. uh, so we're gonna start with BCBA qualifications and then perhaps sometime in the future add additional qualifications too, maybe ones that are specific to autism, right. um, etc. But for now, it's a great place to start, and it looks like that's probably the direction that they're going to go in. Wonderful. And so you went up and basically were there for the day. And yeah, it was, a, uh, it was a six and a half hour meeting. <laughs> wow. Where they the task force just drilled us with questions. They had a you know about five or ten page agenda. Of so questions. everybody was there for the whole time, and they just would ask you questions, and anybody could field. That's exactly right. All okay. six of us on the six or five or seven or uh, on the panel, on the expert panel, were basically supposed to chime in on each of the questions. Okay. Wow. And so you got a feel for, though, uh, who these people were that are making these choices and, and you felt like they were going in the right direction. I did, yeah. And it's interesting because, um, you know, there's a large variety of folks on the task force. Mm -hmm. um, some, A couple of them were parent advocates, which I think is mm -hmm. tremendous, yeah. very important. Um, a couple of them were from the medical insurance industry. Right. Uh, a couple of them were uh, state officials uh, who work in uh, the Department of Managed Health Care. Mm -hmm. um, but only one of them was actually an ABA person, which I find That's very kind of interesting, interesting right? Because the only really consistently proven treatment for autism right. so far is ABA. Right. And so the purpose of the task force was to figure out how autism treatment can be covered by medical insurance, and there's only one ABA person out of wow. about 10 or 12 people on the task force. Very so interesting. So I think that's why they brought this expert panel, because right. most of us were uh, in ABA. So Very, very interesting. But yeah, they're uh, going in the right direction. And did you feel like, this is an odd question, but do you do you feel like you learned something that day? Uh, was there anything that you walked away and you were like, okay, this is very interesting, and I didn't know this when I walked in the door? Well, just kind of the whole political process. I mean, yeah. I'm definitely not a politician. I'm a scientist and a clinician at heart right. um, and I don't want to be a politician. Right. <laughs> um, I think most people in their right mind feel right, that right, way. Right. Absolutely. You know? So yeah, I did learn a little bit about the whole process. Everyone's kind of wrangling and lobbyists, right. you know, there and trying to have secret conversations and oh. backdoor deals and all kinds oh, of things. But, uh, but overall, I have to say, it, you know, it was a very positive experience okay. and they are going in the right direction. Uh, there was opportunity for public comment and um, probably five or ten parents of folks with autism called in okay. uh, and or were present and made comments and, and voice their concerns. Uh, one individual on the spectrum, a young man, he's probably 18 or 20 years old, came in and, and gave uh, made a comment in okay. person. Uh, he was primarily concerned with um, ethical uh, treatment uh, of challenging behaviors and um, you know, uh, barring the use of aversives and things like that. So Wonderful. it was great to see folks from the ASD community speaking there as well. Wonderful. Will you do me a favor, if there's another event like that coming up where parents can phone in, will you let us know so we can Absolutely. tell people so that they can Absolutely. phone? Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you so much for coming in today and sharing all this wonderful information, which is so useful. We are at the end of our time. And in fact, I was going to go to a break. We don't even have time for that. So I'm, I, I'm uh, just going to let you know that as this show ends, the conversation continues. I'm going to ask for Matt to very quickly cycle through some of the different ways that you can get a hold of us. Over this long weekend, I want you to know that Autism Live continues to play 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're only live from 9 a.m. in the morning till noon Pacific Standard Time, but we do continue to play and there are lots of places you can watch us there's email go ahead and cycle through them Matt because I know we're almost out of time but you can email us you can phone and leave a message you can uh, talk to us on Facebook you can talk to us via tweet you can be watching us here on 
Autism Hyphen Live. You can be watching us on Blip TV. You can be downloading us for free on iTunes. You can catch us on our own YouTube channel, and we are available on Ustream. All of those different ways that you can participate in the conversation. I know that many of you have written in with suggestions for ideas that we're going to be covering in the coming months and people that you would like to see on the show. I can't tell you how much we appreciate all of your comments and all of your suggestions and topic ideas because we are here to help you, to give you the information that you need so that you can be the most effective, most efficient member of your child's team that you can possibly be. We know that all of our children have progress that they can obtain if we use these tools that we talk about creating creatively. Use the information that we have at our fingertips. So please take advantage of this opportunity. Tell us what you need. Tell us the questions you have and the kinds of things that you want covered. And also the kinds of research that you want, right? They can be going to your website and saying the kinds of research that they want. Tell us again what what that website address is. Mm www.autismresearchgroup.org. Okay, so fabulous. Uh, this, This is the moment, you guys, where your voice can be heard and you can help to further things. So I hope you'll participate with that. Uh, We are going to be back on Monday and we have some fascinating people that are going to be in here next week. We've got a lot of different authors that are going to be coming in. I don't have the book here uh, to show you, but we're going to be talking about teaching art to uh, people on the spectrum and some different techniques that we can use to teach art, which is a very beneficial thing. That's going to be on Monday, so you're going to want to be with us for that. Until then, then I want to remind all of you to please give your kiddos a hug from me. Bye-bye for now. Was I even-